I did. Um, I talked to you beforehand. You were like, try to sneak in like a reference to Blake Bortles, mm -hmm. which I did. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was just like, um. I was talking about the benefits of playing American football, and I was like, yeah, in the U.S., kids grow up looking up to people like Tom Brady and Blake Bortles, not right. just for what they did on the field, but yeah. for who they are off the field. Welcome back to Macrodosing. It is Thursday. It's November 2nd. And we're back. We got myself. Donnie's joining us because he's got some irons in the fire. We got a trip coming up that we're going to get into today. Trip to Uganda. Billy's here. Big T is remote. Big T might have the big C right now. We don't know. Maybe it's just the big F. The he, big F? For... He, he's sick. Oh, yeah. The flu. It's, it's, it's F or C, I, I believe. Yeah. It's like, like my high school report card. That's what Big T's dealing with. Then we've got Arian is is not here today uh, because he is very under the weather. He He's got the C. He's got the cocoa. Um, but we're we're gonna power through. We're gonna keep our heads down. We got a big big episode today. All right, we're back. We're bad. We're feeling good. Feeling great. Mostly. Uh, big T thoughts and prayers to you. Uh, I'm gonna give you the opportunity right now. Would you like people's thoughts or would you like their prayers? Um, you don't have to, I'm, I'm built different. I'll be fine. You don't have to do anything. So neither thoughts nor prayers for big T. Yeah. You can just keep going. What about T H O T S? -s? I'm good on that too. Okay. No, okay. Just no checking. thoughts. Um, Billy, we're waiting for Billy to send the, uh, send the sheet over. It's a little behind the scenes housekeeping. <laughs> Billy's been asked to put together a, uh, a list of topics to run through at the start of every show. We decided that would be good so that everybody could be on the same page with that. And Billy's like, yeah, no problem. I'm going to do that in the mornings. Uh, Billy is 0 for 1 on that well, on Monday's I show. And then uh, about five minutes ago, I was like, hey, Billy, have you done that sheet? And he was like, yeah, I have. And uh, I was the like, sheet okay, just got it, sent to you. Send it to the group chat. Also, you're doing a lot thing, of you were you're doing a lot of typing there. Bro. Little thing, little thing. Uh, we're started two hours early today. Uh, small caveat, and I'm preparing for one of the biggest trips of my life. So I'm sorry if that sort of slipped my mind. And you were you were, yeah you were preparing on Monday morning too. You and spent the last two days getting prepared, so you weren't able to do the sheet on Monday. Well, I just sent it. It's in the group chat. And you also claim that you wake up at five. 5 a.m. every morning so that does leave you plenty of time usually to work out well maybe sometimes you have to skip a workout so you, you can get the sheet no done. then then if i skip a workout then nothing's getting done because then my brain can't work how long did you work out for i i work out i prep and all at the same time so, so how long it sounds like the, you didn't the do sheets, the prep the sheets, this morning. look look if we want to go through all the topics in the sheet you're uh, deflecting right now, Billy. I'm, it's in it's in the group chat right now. Mm -hmm. Now it is, yeah. Yeah. So it's done. We have five topics, links included, and they're all there. You were you were physically incapable of admitting that you lied about something. Physically incapable. It's it's. Wonder. I have okay. So here's another thing. My list was on the PC, right? So then getting mm -hmm. it from the PC to the group chat took some time. I'm sorry because PCs and Macs aren't as compatible. That's one of the that was one of the things. So I had to copy it quickly. You were doing a you were doing I, a I lot forgot of to typing send it for, through email. I forgot to send it through email. I don't know if Mac and PC that might be on me. It might be on me because I usually use a Mac, so I don't know on a PC it probably isn't just like control C to copy and then control V to paste something, right? You have to probably type in lines of code. I mean, I just copied it down. By also, I don't want to pile on, but the first link <laughs> Billy sent um, does seem to be giving my phone cancer. Uh, it's from <laughs> anwaj.media, mm -hmm. and uh, my phone seems to be really not liking it. Okay. Well, <laughs> is this a list of a like... Mac yeah. <laughs> so... He is yeah. incapable of admitting a lie. Incapable. It's... No, it's I, I had the sheet ready. I forgot to send it. I'm sorry. It's now in the group chat. Okay. It's, it is in the group chat. That's a fact. So um, first of all, there's one big story that's not on the sheet that maybe we should talk about right off the bat because it happened overnight. Oh, yeah. 
at about midnight central time, 1 a.m. Eastern time. I guess it would be 10, 10 p.m. Pacific time. Josh McDaniels was relieved of his duties as the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, it seems like a weird time to fire somebody on a, a Tuesday night, but Mark Davis is an innovator, and I, I trust his judgment. Yes. I I was not paying attention to that because I had to prep to go on Ugandan TV at 2 a.m. last night. <laughs> yeah, let, let's get into that in a second. <laughs> yes, that's a good, that's, talk about that. That's a good teaser. Did you see the, the presser that Josh McDaniels was dressed up as Mark Davis when it happened? Are you serious? Wait, did you not see this? I may have been getting got... That, but no, that can't be are, true. That are you serious? True. Wait, I saw Mad something Dog, on Twitter. It. Hold on, let me go find it. Mad Dog, I saw you're something not on Twitter that Josh McDaniels dressed up as Mark Davis for Halloween yesterday. Yeah. And even got his signature P.F. Chang's lunch, I guess, that he no The reveal that's no about way. to happen is going to be so amazing. And then also, again, I may have been getting got. Yeah. Where'd you see this? Twitter. And I also, you guys saw I got got the other day. But. Um, then it said that he opened his fortune cookie and then Mark Davis said, you're fired, sucker, or something. No way. Hold on, let me find it. Okay. No, that's yeah. gotta be... That's what probably publication? Like, that's, that out. that's probably PFT's Guys, I wasn't checking my sources. Article. Hold on. That Hold sounds on. like... No way. That sounds like athletic plus. It said that he was dressed up as Mark Davis for Halloween and that Mark Davis went with it the whole day. Hold on. That's crazy. So Mark Davis played along and then got PF Chang's and then the fortune cookie fired him? That's what it said. Wait. Getting fired by Fortune Cookie is one of the most incredible things I've ever heard. That's a power move, if true. Are there ways to just get like custom Fortune Cookies made fast? I think that there are. I don't know what the turnaround time would be, but that's actually that's a good idea for a line of business is to do like two hour Fortune Cookies. Yeah. So if you need one in a pinch, you just hit them up. Okay, we can make it happen. I'm sure that there's a way to do that. All you yeah. need is a bunch of cookies and then some tweezers and a printer, right? Because if I could just slip some of those in White Sox Dave's Chinese food bag, like he would be like so caught off guard. Like he would be like, what the fuck? Like if, if you made the fortune like very personal to him, yeah, he would be like something. There's some fuckery afoot. These people <laughs> like stay away from Velcro walls. Yeah. You could also fuck with people like I could fuck with Big Cat and just have one that says uh like Deontay Johnson anytime touchdown. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> and then he'd have no choice but to bet it. Mad Dog, have we had any luck That'd tracking a, that down? Good series. No, I'm I swear on my life I saw it this morning. Mm-hmm. Cause I those things don't pop up on my Twitter all the time. Yeah. And now I can't find I'm seeing like tweets about it, uh-huh. but I'm not seeing the original tweet that I saw. Let me let, let me, me keep looking. I, I, I'm gonna try to track down the original tweet real quick. I saw it that it said Mark, er, Describe it for Josh, me. It was a it was a picture, which is why I'm having more trouble finding. It was a picture image, yeah. of a um, of like text. Okay. So like it was from someone screenshotted a part of an article. Okay. It, it looked like it came from a reputable. Uh, yeah, publication. they were using. Yeah, they were using like Times New Roman twelve. Yeah, MLA. Okay. Yeah, they were in it. I'm looking at it. It's um. This is Calibri font, I believe. Wait. Because that's what that's it? what the athletic uses. So. Um, yeah, the original source on this is PFT Commenter, and it was tweeted out at like 12.30 a.m. Wait, was it you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> this, this was... Um, I knew it. I knew you it. Wait, God damn it. You, Are you serious? You, you're not familiar with the Athletic Premium Plus. This is no. this is a service <laughs> I subscribe to that not everybody gets. It's for... Wait, it's, that? Yeah. Who is you? Fuck. So you, you get the basic... You get the basic athletic. I get the Athletic Premium Plus, and it's $499 a month. And you get their instant inbox feature and you have to pass a credit check to get access to like the real stories. And then you get uh, help once a year. I think, is it um, <laughs> Ken Rosenthal? I think he writes for The Athletic. <laughs> Ken Rosenthal, um, he'll come to your house and he'll sit with you if you pay for the extra uh, yeah. diamond feature, the diamond add-on. <laughs> Ken Rosenthal will sit with you while you do your fantasy baseball draft. And then on trade deadline, yes. so Diana Rossini at The Athletic, right. she'll actually come and uh, she'll hand write mm-hmm. her Thursday articles <laughs> and then send them to you first. Yeah. Yeah. So you get those on Wednesday and yeah. they're in her handwriting. She actually <laughs> does it like that and then somebody else transcribes it. So if you pay extra for The Athletic, you get so much more, so many more features. 
I got this in the okay. instant inbox that I logged into last night. Um, does a retinal scan on your computer. So it's like, it's very secure. And then it tells you the real stories that happen before everybody else. So yeah, the story. Oh, that's so funny. I'm sorry. I definitely got Thank you. Did you <laughs> Thank you for tweeting that out. Otherwise, the rest of us wouldn't have known. I know. Yeah. I yo, wouldn't have known. Listen, I'm not supposed to. That's the thing is like, if you tweet out, if you tweet out screenshots of any premium plus article right, what to people that don't pay for it, you get a strike. Oh. And so you get you get three strikes a quarter, mm -hmm. and then if you do any more than that, then they kick you off, mm -hmm. and you actually owe them money. Okay. So well, how many strikes have you gotten? Already. It seems yeah. to be quite a few at this point. No, it's three strikes per quarter. So, so it's like twelve a year, really. Twelve a year, yeah. You're on a once you know what's a month the, basis. Kind the of craziest thing. part about that whole saga, and shout out Joe Pompliano for uh, tweeting this tweet's real. Uh, so with the Raiders firing Josh McDaniels last night, they are now paying somewhere between 40 million and 80 million for both him and John Gruden, who resigned in 2021, not to coach. That's insane. That like, is how, how does an organization deal with that? Based like close to 40 <laughs> to $80 million to not have a coach. Like that is, that is insane. It's absolute insanity. And, uh, when they gave Josh McDaniels this contract, I think everybody had the same question, which is like, hey, wait a second. You gave John Gruden a 10-year contract. Now you're getting McDaniels for a six-year deal. What happens when you want to fire him? Mark Davis doesn't give a fuck. Is that the case with most coaches in the NFL? They, they have they're like guaranteed. A, yeah, they're all guaranteed contracts. I think so. But there's usually offset language in there. Which means that if you get a job, like if, if Josh McDaniels got hired tomorrow by, I don't know, hypothetically, the New England Patriots brought him back to be an offensive assistant, um, then I think the money that New England would pay him would count towards the money that Las Vegas still owes him. Okay. Yeah, you so, have to prove that you're looking for a job, and then if you get one, that comes out of the money that the buyout is the team that's paying the buyout. I didn't know that you had to prove that you were looking for a job. That's oh, yeah. Awesome. So when Butch Jones got fired from Tennessee, he went and got a job in quotation marks, making 30 grand a year being an analyst for Nick Saban. So then he could still get the, all of his buyout money and say that he had a job. I love that. I think that's the case to collect unemployment, too. Don't you have to prove that you're at least trying to find a new job? Yeah, okay. you do. You do. So it sounds like he was – what I would do if I was Josh McDaniels, I would just like email – um, like the main contact us page at every NFL team, like once a month. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then like send a screenshot of that. I'm looking, I, I sent my resume to the Jaguars this yeah. morning. Um, haven't heard back yet, but really feeling good about this opportunity. <laughs> Do you think by digging up the emails that might have violated some morality clause and Gruden's contract isn't guaranteed and that's like how they wanted to get rid of him? Because that's probably makes sense why these crazy stories sometimes come out about coaches because it gets them out of their job without paying their guaranteed contracts. Like the MSU coach. Yeah. Uh, Mel Tucker. Yeah. Yeah. So I, last I heard Gruden was firing the, or he was, he was suing the Raiders for like illegal termination of contract or something like that. So uh, I don't know exactly how that's going, but if they are paying both John Gruden and Josh McDaniels, like that's a, that's an insane amount of money to pay people to not coach your team. I'll co I'll, I've been not yeah. coaching the Las Vegas Raiders for free my entire life. I feel like a sucker. Dude, dude, I would tell like if the owners are looking for a head coach, I'll be a head coach for a very inexpensive fee of $1 million. And I'll do a bunch of stuff that will help the team. Just let, you know, coordinators coordinate, you know, be a little hands off, but like, help with the culture and maybe set up a bounty program, but in crypto. So it doesn't really count. You know what I'm saying? Off like it's books. unregulated. So if it's going from like, that doesn't count as a bribe. You can't bribe with crypto because it's what technically are you not do currency. If and when crypto crashes and then the players that you paid are pissed off. And so now they blow the whistle on the whole thing because what well, you, you could have given them 50 grand. Now it's worth seven. So exactly. So part of this is making sure the global banking crisis continues uh, and that crypto maintains its value. If you haven't seen lately, crypto has been uh, over 30K, Bitcoin specifically. And uh, yeah, that's part of my plan. Crypto will So that's never probably crash. the hardest part that's what you're of not, the job. That's not what you're realizing, Big T, is crypto is safe and it will never crash. Right. That's what I've heard from people 
heavy in crypto. I like mm-hmm. I like Billy's uh, Billy's crypto analysis. He's got like the the attention span of a goldfish. He's like oh, these board ape things. They're going to be worth so much money. Crypto is going to be incredible. You can put you can trade them on the Silk Road, and and it's great because it's an online marketplace that nobody can ever access. Well, so, actually, to be honest, a lot of terrorist groups are getting paid in crypto right now. That may be the reason why they're getting jacked up. I so. lost a lot of money during the crypto craze of what like 2022 i was buying ass coin just because like it had a cool name and people said <laughs> mm-hmm. it was going to make me a lot of money i bought puss coin that went just to zero yeah yeah that's like that coin does not even exist anymore we got heavily How's come rocket doing that's yeah i was about to bring that up we got leveraged in uh in come rocket we we're up to our next in come rocket and uh, i remember the day after we talked about it on the show like there's a bunch of people online that you know, they, they gas up whatever coin they're particularly in, involved in. And uh, the the stock or the price of Come Rocket jumped up like 20%. And everybody online was like, holy shit, this podcast in Barstool Sports is talking about Come Rocket. We're going to the moon, boys. Yep. And then at that point, I realized, well, this is going to be a terrible investment. If like the biggest news that's ever happened to their fake coin is that macrodosing talked about it for like yeah. 10 minutes on the air. Uh, that's, that's not a good sign. Let's see what Come Rocket come rocket is at right now you know would really yeah. suck if you had coin that just you forgot about and then like somewhere along the line when you weren't checking it it like blasted off to like a dollar each after being like a cent and you were like a millionaire for a brief moment but you like had no idea yeah i mean that is probably going to happen to me because all those shitty coins i bought i still yeah. have but i just like stop looking at them because it's exactly. too depressing i just kind of forgot about them and I'll check back like in five years, but did I anyone have, else see I don't have much hope. dumb money? The movie about uh, the GameStop thing? No, I haven't seen it yet, but it looks really nice. good. It, commercial. it was good. Apparently, some of the hedge fund guys who it's based on were not happy that the movie was even being made. I'm sure. Yeah, ha- yeah. Um, my my friends. Friend of a friend's husband, I guess, um, was a hedge fund manager during all that. And she was like, he's like waking up in the middle of the night in cold sweats. Like he was panicking. Like, have they figured this all out? Yeah. Have the common people figure out a way to beat us? Yeah. I'm getting fucked. I'm going to watch this. I'm definitely going to watch Dumb Money. Uh, but Donnie, let's talk about going on Uganda national TV at 2 a.m. local time. That's That shows commitment. You stayed up. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, I'm not as sharp at 2 a.m. And I didn't rock shades and my eyes look rough, at least in a few uh, a few of the screenshots. We can have one pop up on the YouTube screen. Let's uh, let's back this up and, yeah. and zoom out for a second here. Yeah. So <laughs> I- explain to us why you were on Uganda National Television and what you're doing with Billy. So it all started with a tweet I was tagged in. Someone um, tagged me in a tweet that was posted by the African... Football Federation, American Football Federation, and it was like Africa Zone Series this November, Kenya versus Uganda. And they were like, Donnie, you got to go to this. And I was like, well, I don't have any plans in November. And I just sent the Ugandan Football Federation a DM, and he was pumped right off the bat that like an American journalist was showing interest. Mm-hmm. And he was like, we would love to have you out. Um, so I asked Barstool, I was like, could I go to this thing? And they were like, yeah, sure. And um, then I asked Hank, like, would one of the part of my take brands want to sponsor the game? And he was like, yeah, I mean, part of my cheesesteak could use some solid publicity. Um, so uh, I asked my contact in Uganda. He was like, yeah, we would love a sponsor. We just need help getting pads out to um out to Africa. Uh, so we were going to air freight them out, but then they, w- they wouldn't arrive in time. So now just me, Billy, and a cameraman are each going to be bringing a giant duffel bag filled <laughs> with pads to Uganda. What kind of pads are they? Uh, they need new shoulder pads. Okay. And they also need uh, helmet straps. They've got helmets, but a lot of them don't have straps. And like last game they played, people just didn't have the straps on which is pretty dangerous. Yeah. Um, And then I asked Barstool, you know, what if I brought a football guy like Billy Football to help coach? And 
they okayed that too. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not expect to get the green light on all this. Um, and then Billy was down to go too. Um, apparently, I was down to go to Tanzania randomly. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was almost a trip to Tanzania for a football match, but now <laughs> we're going to a football match. Um, because I'm a football guy, you know, obviously I won a Super Bowl in China. I've never coached football. And so I figured it'd be, it'd be good having a football mind like Billy with me out there. Mm -hmm. Um, especially someone who's played QB. So maybe he can kind of be their quarterback coach. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just worried if they have Billy actually calling the plays. Yeah. I don't That's know. So what, what is their expectation? Like they have a coach, right? I they, like it's so I've I've been in communication uh he, with the coaching staff. Well, you've been in communication with the Ugandan quarterback. Yes, right? and then got the coach's number. So okay. the current state I, I've got I think I have a little more uh I've been looking up so we're playing Kenya. Mm -hmm. So the Royal Leaders, we Africa. are now Uganda. Really? Yes. Kenya Ke Kenya's whooped Uganda's ass. Uh, the uh, past two times they played, once in Kenya and once in Uganda. I think the – when you say whoop their ass, I think the score was 6-0. Six, 6-0. Zero. Six, six, zero. <laughs> okay. Um, are we, okay. Listen, the score of one. Listen, we covered. Uganda yes. covered last time. Yeah. No, it's uh, – basically, there's one coach for the team, and uh, I've been in contact with the quarterback looking at their playbook. They don't have a playbook yet. Um, they have a bunch of pictures of – plays they found on the internet and uh so hopefully after a couple conversations with the head coach that i'm currently having i want to just establish you know we're going to run a couple plays and we're just going to get those plays down packed because as bruce lee once said and i'm going to butcher this quote i fear the man who doesn't know many kicks but knows one kick really well mm -hmm. so uh you know, depending on what happens, maybe uh, we're just going to, you know, advise the head coaches. I don't know if he'll let me call plays in the game and be a, the both the OC and DC. But uh, basically, I, I have a bunch of buddies who played overseas football and I've been consulting with them on foreign players and what parts of the game they really struggle with by not growing up playing American football. And it's stuff that, you know, once they understand the concept of, uh, they really start playing better. So like, uh, and this guy coached in Italy that's uh, consulting me and Germany um, is the idea of pursuit, angles of pursuit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they play rugby, uh, they play other sports, but something that is sort of foreign to international players is the idea of angle of pursuit from a set play. So for example, if you're the corner who's lined up on the opposite side of the field, when you're running to tackle a guy, you don't want to run down the line of scrimmage because if he breaks away, he's gone. You want to run down the field on an angle and catch him. We're talking you hypotenuses. Know, that's some, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're talking triangles. And, you know, that was a drill I remember Pythagorean running in middle theorem. school. Yeah. That just, you know, I always like thought that everyone thought that way that you're, you know, try to cut them off from a long touchdown. But that's something that can help a team immensely because, you know, from preventing breakaway runs. Mm -hmm. Stuff like gap, uh, like uh, gap discipline is something that also isn't taught. The idea that you have eleven guys hitting eleven gaps—that's yeah. something that also isn't you don't, really grasped. You don't have to coach us right now, Billy. Save this for yeah. the kids, uh, Billy. I know. One, yeah, I, I love your passion and your yeah. enthusiasm. One thing I'm thinking about though is uh, it sounds to me like defense probably isn't the biggest issue because. The score was 6-0 last time. Yeah. So right. maybe putting some offensive plays, that might right. be helpful. So that is also – I'm saving that for – there's there's some stuff I'm going to implement. I don't want Kenya to hear us because oh, okay. Kenya hears yeah, about they, some plans. There's Kenyans everywhere. Smart. You know, Smart. some things probably haven't been seen in the foreign game but are pretty easy to teach, like crackback blocks. Flea flicker. Yeah, like Ooh, motion and crack blocks. I'm down to be the defensive coordinator. Um, I can teach them a few things about yeah. containment. Like defensive end is a pretty easy position if you think of it as just you take three steps, turn, and then contain. You don't let, mm -hmm. don't let anyone get outside of you. Mm -hmm. um, so you just three steps, turn, and then you got to quickly 
realize, all right, do I rush the QB because he's passing it? Do I charge in because it's a run down the inside? Or are they trying to do a sweep run on the outside and you got to contain and make sure no one gets outside? Mm -hmm. Also, they may want us to play. We don't know. We don't exactly know. And also the rules don't say that's not okay. (laughs) You're allowed to play for the Uganda national team? The AAF doesn't have any specific rules about foreign players. I mean, if that's what it takes to beat Kenya, sure, I'm in. Now, here's the thing, too. We're only going to have, like, one practice with them, and then it's the game. Okay, so we have to prioritize, like, what yeah. what can you work on in one practice? Because one explosive play on offense could make the difference in this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It really could. So you got to figure – I, I would I would come into this – I would come into this practice, not to tell you guys how to do your job, but – I would come into it with like two plays, maybe three, that are easily teachable in one day that you can then get reps of, practice, 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 and then those two plays, maybe three, could make all the difference in the game. But you have to think which plays are easiest to teach quickly to these guys. So probably not you know, with a guard and a center pulling, probably not plays that require too much motion, um, something easy to execute and practice. So... Think about that. Yeah, I would also love us to complete at least a few passes because it's just going to be a little boring if we just run, run, run. Even though that would be the easiest move. Do we know what the box score looks like? Install a triple option. I'm thinking of installing a read option. I've been talking with the quarterback about just sending him highlights and play concepts um, through WhatsApp, and uh, we have a good repertoire going. So, like, hopefully, we just take. um, we should take the playbook from NFL Blitz. Just use that. <laughs> that it's actually very is a clear. genius idea. It's, v- it's very easy to understand. I remember they got like all the X's and O's and the routes. Um, also, one thing to note, the Ugandan quarterback has one of the best QB names of all time. Marv Twist. Oh, shit. <laughs> Isn't that sick? That's great. Marv Twist? Marv Twist, baby. I mean, yeah, you. That sounds like a triple option quarterback. Have, <laughs> yes. you, have you watched any tape of him? Um, no. If we can find tape, I'm going to send it to Che because, listen, Che gets a lot of hate, but he helped me win a Chinese Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I sent him a bunch of tape, and he dissected them to a T. I love that. Yeah, get Che involved. Marv Twist. I want. I wonder what Twist. type of quarterback he is. I feel like a flea flicker would be very, very effective. And I, I also, think. No I also, offense, I think a flea flicker would be the the worst thing to do. Why? As a trick play wise, because it involves too much. Like it's a it's a fumble waiting to happen at this level. But they play rugby. Yeah, but you know, there's no blocking in rugby. Yeah, but I mean, the blocking is the same as any other pass play. I know, but we don't even know. We have to. There, we might have to learn a little more blocking and tackling. Like we might spend our whole time just perfecting blocking schemes because that would actually be the best way to help them. I want to beat Kenya so damn badly that we're not going to be doing crazy stuff. We're going to be blocking and tackling, and we're going to beat Kenya with Ugandan grit. Yeah, but Bill, you can't. Here's what I'm saying: is you have one practice with them. How much do you think you can improve all of their fundamentals in like? two hours well we're gonna be with them for a longer amount of time we're gonna have like a six hour practice yeah they're in training camp and i'm texting with the guys like giving i'm more giving advice when it comes to play calling coaching the playbook because they haven't even made that yet so you know if we can get some solid stuff run then we can impact the team better. Double moves. Put in a double move with a pump fake. Yeah, that oh. would be perfect. Like a pump fake is a better, like our ideas of trick plays are way too complicated, but our little things like a pump move is a trick play equivalent to them. I don't think a pump fake has been thrown in these games. I've been watching tape. What about what about the hook and ladder? A hook and ladder could work, but the thing is a play action is a trick play. Like this is, you know, we're yeah. teaching the game. What about the onside kick? Is this how we make it relevant? Oh, the onside yes, kick. Yes, yes. That yeah, would work. Surprise onside kick? Yeah. Like Sean Payton in the Super Bowl? Just every – we could onside every play. I think that would actually be a pretty effective way to get an advantage on kick. Kenya. Yeah. So, so Donnie, how did the hit go? 
the hit went well. It was actually, so it was via Zoom, but I couldn't see myself on the Zoom. All I could see was, and I couldn't see them either. I could just see like a black screen and I could barely hear them through the headphones. So I was like, am I even on Ugandan TV? But like, <laughs> um, but this morning they sent me a few clips and yes, I was on Ugandan national TV. I love it. What did they um, ask you about? Um, they just asked me like what I think about uh, like American football growing in Africa. And if I had any advice for them, I did. Um, I talked to you beforehand. You were like, try to sneak in like a reference to Blake Bortles, mm -hmm. which I did. Oh, nice. Yeah. I was just like, um, I was talking about the benefits of playing American football. And I was like, yeah, in the U S kids grow up looking up to people like Tom Brady and Blake Bortles, not <laughs> nice. just for what they did on the field, but yeah. for who they are off the field. Yeah. Because it's a sport that can really help you build character. Fact. Yeah. And then I, yeah, I dropped some Bill Belichick quotes about do your job. I also, um, I also just stole that quote from JJ Watt being that success isn't owned. It's leased and rent <laughs> is due every day. <laughs> I love it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I took a, a look at a few of the clips. I was introduced by my full government name. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Which is which is fine. Donnie does. Doxton, Uganda. Yes. They said Donnie does. Yeah. Uh yeah, you know what? It gets it gets easier, Donnie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole full government name thing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You're gonna need Jerry, Jersey Jerry, to hang out next to you and just only call you by your government name all the time. Okay. And then that'll make it a little bit easier too. There's there's a certain amount of people that um just call me by my real name and it works. And uh Jerry's one of them. It's like Jerry Dan Campbell, the first time we interviewed him, he just kept calling me by my name. Uh, and then Hank, when he's feeling snippy, he'll oh, sometimes shit. he'll yep. sometimes just like if he's if he's angry, hasn't slept, yawning a lot, he'll just break that out, or he'll he'll say like, "Okay, PFT commentator," and that's that's Hank being like super sarcastic. That's when I know he need, he needs a nap. Aaron, yes. will, Aaron will throw yeah, that Aaron time. Yeah, yeah, Aaron too, does. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, excited. We had to get our yellow fever vaccines. We got malaria pills uh and i got oh, my I flu shot up. i got my flu shot while i was getting my yellow fever vaccine so thankfully uh don't have the flu like big t yeah um we may try to Counts do a blessings. gorilla trick while we're out there that's so, my dream man yeah like even if i have to pay out of pocket i feel like if you're in uganda it's it's worth seeing some gorillas yeah it's one of the few places where they exist yeah the mountain gorillas are native to that part of, of africa and i've seen some clips from the from the tracks i think francis he went to uganda right uh yeah he was in rwanda. he went to rwanda okay yeah for his honeymoon it's we would do like a three-day thing where you drive a full day out to the forest where they live you spend a full day trekking with them and then you drive back a full day it's a lot of walking yeah i can i can handle that yeah uh but i i've seen some of the the clips where they meet the gorillas and it it looks like a life-changing experience having a gorilla just like hang out next to you. You're not supposed to make eye contact with them. That's what I've heard. That yeah. would make sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like, is that just a general rule of like all animals really? Probably. Yeah. No, no. In gorillas, they, they can process it because we're both primates and they like direct eye contact is like, that's what silverbacks do to each other when they want to fight. That's like, I'm here to take your troop, take all your women. I'm going to stare you right in the eyes. And that means it's on. It looks like they interpret like you, it you as gotta mean side eye them. You got a side on. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can't like, you can't even look them directly in the eyes, side eyes. Whoa. So you just like glance at them. Whoa. Uh, right. But yeah, that sounds, that sounds incredible. And it sounds like you guys are doing a good thing too. Yes. And uh, thank you. Pardon my cheesesteak for helping out. Happy to do it. And Billy, Billy was chosen because of his football acumen. And also he's the perfect guy. If you want to go to a foreign country and just like give him a giant bag of equipment to carry. Yes. Billy is your guy for that. Uh, yes. And also on the way there, we have a 14 hour layover in Cairo. So fun. We're going to be able to see the pyramids. I know that it might be like a kind of a dangerous area to be right now, but I've, um, I've heard if you just, Go to the touristy parts. You'll be fine. Yeah. I, I was um, I was reading something. I think it, it was probably on Reddit the other day about what the worst places in the world to visit are in terms of just like bad time. 
And far and away, the most popular answer was Egypt. So I've heard some negative things about Egypt, um, but not the pyramids. Right. It was mostly about if you're a woman that goes to visit Egypt, you're going to be aggressively pursued and catcalled and like harassed your entire time there if you're in like if you're in most parts of Cairo. Yeah. I'm sure the tourist areas are are not quite as bad, but it was like across the board, just every post was like, Yeah, Egypt was the worst experience I've ever had in my life. Okay. That's that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we make it to Uganda and don't only get as far as Cairo. Well, you guys aren't hot chicks, so. No, we're not hot chicks. I heard like if you if you have any sort of camera, you get hounded and they like want to know what you're doing. And it's like, dude, I'm going to the pyramids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty basic stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about this trip to Uganda, guys. Yeah. I can't wait to follow along. And when are, when are you leaving? Um, we leave Saturday, 2 p.m. Okay. Yeah, I figured, you know, Obviously, my first choice would have been like Will Compton, Taylor Luan, Arian Foster, but I don't think I'm getting them to Uganda mm -hmm. at the moment. So, Billy Football was next up. <laughs> Billy, next man up. Let's go. Billy cares no, about growing the game. Yeah. He cares about the game of football. He does. And Will, he, he Will Compton cares about the f fact that he played football. Yes. You know, like he cares about his personal game. Billy, Billy doesn't do this for the money. Billy does it to enrich people's lives through the sport of football, and I think we should all applaud him for that. We do. D3 football. That's all it's about. How Listen, long is that flight? It's brutal. Um, 10 hours to Egypt. Oh, 10 hours to Egypt, then another probably like four, six or eight to – Oh, it's oh, only four. It's only four. Uganda? It's actually closer than you think. Do we know – It's not closer than I think. <laughs> Egypt to Uganda is closer than you think. 10 hours is a long flight to get there. Do we know what time and when the game is? Um, there the might Sunday. be a, like a live, like the game might be live streamed. It's on, it's on the 12th, November okay. 12th. But, um, we're also going to like put together a full vid recap and maybe drop that and hype it up as like the pardon my cheesesteak Africa bowl or something like that. Um, yeah. Also we're going to the turnover, uh, item that was requested on Monday that we're going to do is going to be a part of my cheesesteak hammer, sledgehammer. Okay. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we get a turnover and, you know, we'll have one of the guys gather the whole defensive round and throw the hammer down and explode everything. You ever seen that? When everyone gets hyped up and one guy has the hammer and then he just slams on the ground. Everyone goes, Whoa. So. Oh, you know, it'd be sick. Okay. What? Going along with this idea, the, the part of my cheesesteak sledgehammer, Mm -hmm. What if it was like the turnover steak? So it was an actual steak and yes. then you got to use the hammer to nail the steak into the ground. That, uh, why didn't I think of that? That's amazing. You were so close. <laughs> yeah. I was so close. <laughs> you were so close, but I like it. So the, you get the, the turnover steak. The turnover steak. Yes. And we can yes, probably find perfect. a steak and a hammer in Uganda. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully there's a sledgehammer in Uganda. Winston so. Churchill once called Uganda the Pearl of Africa. So, mm. Oh, that's nice. I'm pumped. I did not get the typhoid vaccine. Oh, you should. You didn't I get cut costs. I cut costs. You, did, you didn't get the woke typhoid vaccine? Wait, what, dude? That's the one you kind of, like, if you go There's, down. You only need the yellow fever to get into Uganda. You got to show the, the sheet that you got that. But I didn't get the typhoid. I got the typhoid, I, like, three years ago, but it expires after two. Um, oh, you're fine then. I think you just got to like know, like we're only drinking bottled water, bottled water and like well-cooked meat. I'm only, <laughs> I'm only going beer and meat. Yeah. Well, no that's, water. That's what Billy normally does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You don't want to, yeah. Um, you, you don't want to confuse your body with a new diet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, it's, I don't want to get white socks daved and I'm, Probably gonna lose a lot of weight there, just because you know different microbial loads in the water and stuff. So need the Pepto Bismol. Mm -hmm. uh, so Billy, I'm I'm very excited for you. Very excited for you, Donnie. The game I'm looking it up right now is November twelfth. So that's not this Sunday, but it's next Sunday. And what time of day do we know? Because I do want to. We should get this 
on TV at the gambling cave too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, once I find that live stream link, I will send it to you. Okay. Um, I'm very excited that uh, the the Friday or the Saturday before the game, they're doing a uh, parade through the streets of Kampala with all of us wearing American football gear to raise football awareness. That's so cool. <laughs> That's so cool. So that will be fun. I think like uh, like when I was on that show today, the 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 host of the show seemed he's like, so like why should Ugandan youth play American football when like we already have rugby? Do these kids really need another contact sport to play? And I don't know. I was just like – Football helps you learn how to like work together as a team towards a common goal, but I guess you can do that in rugby too. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's kind of the same. Yeah, same principle. Um, you you should like really hammer home the massive contracts you can get in football. You should yeah. be like, hey, Patrick Mahomes, he signed a five hundred million dollar contract. Yes, and shout out. There's a player on the Saints. Uh, Saints to know. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't pronounce his last name, yeah. but he he's a you got an American who is playing for the Saints. That's cool. And in the past, I think there's been like three or four other Ugandan Americans. Yeah, there's a big international program now for for NFL teams where they have a like a roster spot where you can put a guy that is um, from a foreign country that's learning the game. Mm. You can have him on a developmental practice spot uh, that's like a little bit different from the normal practice squad. So you retain that guy's rights, I think, for an exclusive period of time if you're committed to helping this guy – Yes. develop as a football player so there there are opportunities for that it's probably very hard to do but um i'm sure that there are some good athletes over there it, it, what's the quarterback's name marv twist marv twist marv twist i, I god damn god damn i dude, love that's, marv that's, twist that's, that's such a cool name <laughs> it, it really is okay uh anything yeah. else we want to get into about uganda i'm a little nervous but billy's actually had relatives live in africa before so um, they've been offering him some advice too, I'm sure. Yeah, they uh, worked for the State Department. But uh, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, Cairo's definitely going to be the weird spot, but I was talking to some Air Force pilots who were in the office the other day, and I was like, is Cairo going to be bad? And they're like, not if you stay, go directly from the airport to the pyramids, you'll be fine. Okay. What kind of planes did they fly? They fly helicopters, actually. Oh hmm. shit! All right, that's 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 even yeah, they, more advanced than flying a jet. You think? That's not true. No. Okay. If you go <laughs> actually, to actually, the, I have no idea. In uh in the sh in the New York office, they flew a uh, Saturdays are for America flag on a bunch of their missions. Some of the missions like took out some like pretty bad dudes that did a couple IEDs, and uh, they had the flag in their chopper when they were doing it. So that was pretty cool. It's now in the New York City office with a plaque. That's cool. I love that. Um, going to Billy's sheet. Want to check in on this here? Um, Elon Musk has Joe Rogan shoot Cybertruck with Arrow. I actually saw this. That was it was very funny. Pretty dope. Um, so the Cybertruck. Let's talk about the Cybertruck because I I saw this clip and I've seen some clips of the Cybertruck. Elon's always talking about the Cybertruck. Who is the the optimal market for the Cybertruck? Who want who is this car for? Did he is this car for Mars? No, he tried him. to he tried to explain it being like now this is very cool that you can like shoot it with a gun and an arrow and it won't pierce but like yeah. is very useful unless you're like in the military or yeah in the military in like and his 12 15 yeah. Scotland. Yeah. The arrow, the arrow defense yeah. would come in handy. And then Elon's response was like, well, trucks are supposed to be tough. And what's tougher than being able to take a bullet or an arrow? Yeah. I, I love that because somebody's <laughs> like, hey, Elon, quick question. This truck looks great. Uh, it's weird. It's kind of strange design, but it's uh, obviously able to take a lot of damage. Um, what do I need this truck for? Like, I, I'm looking for something to get me to work and back, maybe to Home Depot on the weekends. And his response was like, pussy. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the Venn diagram of people who drive trucks and people who would want to be seen in that are two circles that do not overlap. Also, it's not a truck. 
Oh, I, right. I couldn't. I can't tell from the photo. Like, is there a truck bed in the back? If you, there's a truck bed, that's not a truck guy would not be looking for a bed that small. Yeah, it's definitely got a cover on it. it it's more of a tank. I mean, you know, do I think the same people that drove like jacked up Hummers, yeah, who just like didn't care about being a d bag, are the same people who are going to drive this truck. You're right. I think that's probably a fair comparison. Or the military. Yeah. yeah. Is he trying I mean, to just get a military contract I, out of this? I feel like, I, yeah. I'd test drive it if he wants someone to make it seem a little more like every guy truck. Like, if you want to give me a cyber truck, that'd be fine. I'd do it. I think the truck is for doomsday preppers that are also very um, environmentally conscious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, eco. Eco. Eco fascist. Eco fascist. Yeah. Like, Ted Kaczynski would love this truck, probably. Yeah. Uh, somebody was also pointing out that uh, cars have become, you know, the big innovations in safety over the last 40 years have been crumple zones in cars. So when you pop the hood of a car, you can see like small folds, indentations on the hood. And those are designed to absorb impact when you get into an accident. So it makes you safer on the inside because it takes all the energy that comes along with a massive car crash and the frame of the car absorbs all uh, that energy yeah. transfer. So you personally don't absorb the energy transfer. Um, it seems like the Cybertruck is really going completely against that. And they're just like, we're going to make a truck that's so tough that we don't need crumple zones. Yeah. Which sounds like it's a good idea in theory. But in practice, I don't know if necessarily that's the right way to go. Uh, and I don't recall seeing any crash tests I, on yeah. the Cybertruck. Uh, I don't know what happens if you get into an accident in a Cybertruck. Um, but so I guess it can I was be thinking shot about that by an arrow. Too. I think he's so confident in his uh, safety systems when it comes to like autopilot and stuff that he doesn't think this car will ever crash because it will never allow itself to ram into something. <laughs> okay. Using, using the autopilot? Yeah. This, this sounds like the Titanic. It sounds like he's yeah. built a car version of the Titanic. He's like, well, I don't need to make the water compartments airtight because it's never going to hit anything. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty wild. He also had a cool point that he was like, you know, in all the old movies where you can like shoot behind the the car door. Well, we had yeah, like, old movies when people hide behind cars yeah. when there's like a shootout. Um, yeah. Which does happen in a lot of movies. And he's like, yeah, that's that's fake because in real life, bullets go right through cars, which is actually terrifying because I'm like, whenever I'm walking the streets, I'm like, all right, if somebody pulls out a gun, there's so many cars to hide behind. But well, you're I, supposed to hide guess, behind the I wheel that well. that does not work. Because right. that's where the, that's where the um, skeleton of the car, like, you know, when they're working on the car and yeah. it's got like the interior type thing that looks like a skeleton apparently that is your best chance okay okay uh but it can absorb an arrow we know that uh, and the tommy gun a tommy gun do those even exist anymore <laughs> yes they probably yeah do they well the, the, but they don't usually have the the cylinder clips that's the they tommy usually, gun though yeah but the tommy gun usually has a, a banana clip I don't but, like that. A Tommy gun has a cylinder clip and you hold it at your hip and you're like, yeah, see, and yeah. you just squeeze the trigger and a bunch of guys in suits die. That's what a Tommy gun is. They found someone found a whole like weapons cache of them recently. Uh, it may have been like the Ukraine may have received a box of Tommy guns. And I saw that online. <laughs> yeah. So the drum magazine wasn't typically used with the Tommy gun. Yeah, the Thompson submachine gun. Yeah, it's a very cool gun. But um, during World War II, like so in Call of Duty, they don't have they'll have the Tommy gun, but without the 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 drum clip. OK, drum magazine rather. Yeah. yeah that, the gangsters were rolling in so much money they could buy this hundred round drum magazine. That's why it was so famous. So, um, you remember when when that dude threw a rock through the window of the of the cyber truck at its unveiling? Yes, that was awesome. 
And then Elon was like, well, he wasn't supposed to hit the window with the rock. He was supposed to hit the side of it. And it just shattered. That might have been the funniest thing ever. Yeah. Um, so Elon went on Rogan. And I have not listened to it. I saw the the one clip where they talk about Dave and pizza. And Elon just kept being like, ooh, this is incredible. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, like a... a like a dog that saw snow for the first time. That's what Elon was like with, uh, with his pizza. But I, I haven't, I haven't listened to their actual discussion. Have you Donnie? Uh, I've listened to parts of it. I listened to when Joe asked him why he bought Twitter and he was like, well, I was spending some time in San Francisco and it was like a zombie apocalypse there. Cause everybody's infected with this mind virus that Twitter is propagating. The woke uh, mind virus. Yeah. The woke mind virus. But I'm like, like how many of those like homeless zombies in San Francisco like use Twitter? I've never seen a homeless person on Twitter, so I don't know if they're like directly correlated. But is that he was talking about the homeless people in in San Francisco? They were infected by by wokeism. Yeah, no. or or at least like the woke mind virus that Twitter was propagating leads to rampant like homelessness. Okay. So okay. yeah, so maybe he wasn't saying that those people were homeless because they were using Twitter too much, but I don't know. I feel, I feel like Elon kind of first was doing it as like a flex or like a joke. And then he, he tried to back out at the last moment and they're like, no, you, you can't yeah. anymore. So, so, um, this is not like a retroactive take because we, we were talking about this as it happened and we've been talking about Elon. I, I know for a fact, since we started doing part of my take, we've been talking about Elon being like, he, he wishes he was Tony Stark. He is, uh, he's, a, he's a weird guy, very strange guy. And um, when he first bought Twitter, he very clearly was doing it to be cool online mm -hmm. because I think he's got, he's got friends that are very active on Twitter and he wanted to be like a cool voice on Twitter and he wanted to flex, like you said, and he offered like a joke offer. Uh, which was what, like $69 or I, I forget what it was. He was doing like the whole 69, 420. Oh no, that was with Tesla. He talked about like changing the price of Tesla to like $420, 69 cents a share. Um, and then he wanted to buy Twitter so that uh, he could be cool. And then he reframed it as being like, no, it's for free speech. And then he tried to back out and he was so far in that he would have had to pay a billion dollars to back out. He was like, ah, oh, fuck it. You know what? I'll just go ahead and do this because I'm kind of forced to. Yeah. And uh, take it private, which actually I kind of agree with the fact that Twitter should be a privately held company. I think a lot of companies get into big trouble when they they go public and all of a sudden they've got like all these other factors and the the CEOs, they have to be like first and foremost, maximize value for the shareholder. Yeah. Which can usually then really fuck up the product that you're making and take something that everybody enjoys and turn it into something that's just unrecognizable and way, way less cool. So I agree with what he did there, but uh, yeah, he seems like he doesn't, I don't, I think his plan is to turn Twitter X into the one app that you use on your phone. Yeah. For everything. Which is kind of like what they have in China. WeChat can do like everything that all of our apps can do in one app. Yeah. But he's got a lot of competition in the US. Like, I don't know. Yeah. If people are going to start. Yeah. They just added uh, a way on X that you can make phone calls. So it's kind of like um, Zoom or Skype. And then there's probably a Venmo option. And yep. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's going to work in the US with just all with all the competition from the other apps, unless he just buys those apps and combines them. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any problem with him buying Twitter, but then I think he paid forty billion. Yeah, and it's like Elon Musk always talks about how he wants to save humanity. He's trying to get us to Mars and start a colony in case, like, because like the U, uh, like Earth will be uninhabitable, mm -hmm. you know, at some point down the line. And it's just like there's probably better uses of forty billion dollars. Maybe than buying Twitter. Maybe. But I mean, but yeah. if you, if you have forty billion dollars, you got to spend it on something. Well, there is there's a much better use. Buy a sports team. Buy a sports team. That's well, if if you have that much money. Montana. Yeah, if you have that much money, you don't buy a sports team. Could he buy a league? Or no, <laughs> he couldn't buy. Yeah, he could probably buy certain leagues, but not 
Yeah, he could probably he buy. Could have bought the entire NBA probably ten years ago. Yeah, he could have bought. He could buy Major League Baseball, maybe. But is that going to save humanity? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, maybe if if he if he bought the NBA and then started enforcing traveling and carrying, yeah, then maybe the kids would grow up and they'd have good role models to look up to. Mm, yep. Yeah. Um, institute the five point shot in the NBA, and he should have bought the NBA and instituted North Korean basketball rules to it. Oh yeah, those rules are crazy. I mean, that would be awesome. I don't know if it would save humanity. I think if I had forty billion to try to save humanity, I would invest it all in nuclear fission. Is it because like fusion is nuclear bombs, right? I believe and so. Then, we we actually talked about this not too long yeah. ago. Fission is just recreating the power of the sun, which there's a lot of research going on now. But if we did create that, then it's like it's infinite clean energy. Mm -hmm. And then it would just I think it would solve like almost all of humanity's problems. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. There's like. What if he just bought all the crypto? <laughs> bought all the crypto. Yeah. Puts it all into Doge. Huh. I mean, crypto guys like think that crypto is going to save the world. Mm hmm. Well, Billy says yes. Decentralize the control of currency, maybe. Yeah. Which would prevent, you know, a lot of the financial, complex financial manipulation we're seeing. I think so if like it something was like Twitter, if it was totally decentralized, that would, that would um, have some good benefits. It would also create a whole host of problems that, could probably outweigh all the benefits like what if just there was no regulation whatsoever we have regulation but it's not it's not like a free-for-all and we still have huge problems for example the housing crisis of like 2007 2008 that that almost like ruined the world economy because there was not enough regulation on certain things but the whole idea of over lending couldn't occur because yeah. you wouldn't just be doing pen stroke money. No, I understand that. I'm saying that there would be some benefits, but there are probably a whole bunch of unforeseen consequences to having like completely deregulated finance system. I, w I don't think it would be completely deregulated. Like stealing would still be illegal. No, I, I understand that. But if you think that market manipulation is bad right now, if your answer is completely remove all regulations, that's like the dumbest thing you could possibly think. Well, it more have to do with uh, the central bank's influence on just the flow of money. Yeah. So now we're getting into something that's like way above anything I can even begin to process is like how the Fed works and how central banking works and just yeah. global finance is it's that's it's like studying calculus to me. Well, it, I mean, just like they can't make printer go burr anymore. I don't think it's as so, so you're trying to just reduce everything about an insanely complex international <laughs> system to a meme. And you're like, this is yes, this is finance. And it's the guy with the microwave brain inside. And he just goes, money, go burr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's we probably stop the money going burr. Yeah. We got to make the money less burr. And then our money. Burr. Gucci, man. Lose value. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's uh, that's some Elon talk. Let's go back to Billy's list here. I, there's one thing I do want to talk about from that list. Okay. And it's a super villain, a real life super villain. I know I'm a little late to Hall Halloween, but Martin there, Shirley. Have you guys been seeing that there's been a major bed bug problem in France? Yes. I have not seen that. No. I'm actually concerned like about bringing bed bugs back to the States on this trip just because we might encounter some French people. Well, okay. I'm, I'm concerned because <laughs> I'm actually trying to go to the Paris Olympics. Oh, yeah. Because that it's so – France has experienced an insane bed bug problem. And, you know, all across France you're seeing people throwing out mattresses with uh, plastic wrap around it. And, you know, the subways may have bed bugs, the cafes, you know, the theaters, you know, all the French stuff. There may be bed bugs on every of it. So something that someone found was that back in 2021 on French 4chan, 
some guy posted about like spreading bed bugs across France because he hated France. Like the Johnny Appleseed of, of bed bugs? Yeah. I, I saw this too. He was like breeding them or something. He yeah. just like bred a huge colony of bed bugs and then just unleashed them on the streets of France, which is like straight out of a comic book movie. That's terrorism. Bioterrorism. Yeah. So did he- He was did mailing he post, it. Did he post like pictures of his bed bug farms and all that shit? Or did he just say that he was doing this? He just said he was doing this on this one post on the original French forum. There's videos like circulating. We don't know exactly if they're real or not, but the facts are is that back in 2021, a guy on French 4chan or a French forum Cat, posted Cat that, yeah, <laughs> that, uh, and, and the toi cat, yeah, and that he posted on, uh, that he was doing this. He said that he was mailing it to different parts of France, to random places in France, and may have even released it on the subway himself. So, I mean, and it's been spreading outside of France too. This guy sucks. It's yeah. some shit from the blacklist. That's, yeah. that's, that is, he's the Joker. Yeah. That is, that is something that like Heath Ledger's Joker would do. I hate this. I hate this so much. Have you guys ever had bed bugs? No, I've had scabies. Which scabies is the is, worst. It's kind of similar. Yeah. Yeah. That was horrible. I, I got dude. bed bugs for like a day. So when I lived in Austin, I was poor and uh, I was selling used dogs. I needed a couch for my apartment. And so I didn't really have that much money to go out and buy a couch with. And I went on Craigslist. I went to the free section on Craigslist. Ooh. Yeah, this is maybe the dumbest idea I've ever had. And somebody in my neighborhood was like, we have a couch free to a good home. Come by and pick it up. It's on our porch. And so I drove by. It was like a five minute drive from where I lived, Southeast Austin. And sure enough, there was a couch that was on the porch and it was just me. And so I had to like pick this couch up by myself, put it in the back of my truck. And it never once occurred to me the fact that like, wait, why is this person giving away a couch and why is it outside? Why yeah. do they have it outside their house? And uh, so I took it back and me and Leroy chilled on it for like one afternoon. And I got up and I looked in the mirror and I had three bites that were like going down the back of my shoulder. So that's how you can tell if there's bed bugs. They call it like a stoplight. Yeah. which is like a perfectly straight line of three bites. And uh, I was like, what is this? And I looked it up online and they said, check your couch to see if there's any evidence of like bed bug dirt is what they call it. So it's like blood or maybe bed bug poop. Yeah, I think it's their poop maybe. Yeah. And so I looked inside the couch and there was like, a, a, there was some of it. It wasn't like completely covered in bed, bed bug poop, but there were a couple lines where I was like, oh fuck, that's what this is. So I had to get it out of my apartment. Uh, fortunately, it didn't spread, but that was a bad day for me. I'm never never going to do that again. Never get a free couch online. There's a reason why it's free. PSA for everybody out there. And then there was one time I stayed in a hotel that had bed bugs. And um, yeah, I found some of those bites. And then you have to like take all your clothes, put them in a plastic bag, basically tie the bag off for like a, a month or so. And make sure that they all die and then you get to wash it and then you can wear those clothes again. But bed bugs are they're bad, man. They're real bad. Yeah. Is there any is there like a spray that you can do to the couch that just that like cleanses it? There probably is, but you also that's a dangerous game that you're playing because if you don't get all of them, then you might as well have not even done it at all. Yeah. By the way, here's something. If you ever get scabies and you go to the doctor and all they give you is permethrin cream. Tell the doctor, Billy Football said so, get ivermectin as well okay. because the ivermectin kills, the permethrin will only kill the scabies from surface level and it won't get the eggs and the burrowed scabies deep underneath. Whereas if you take the ivermectin, it pushes the scabies out and kills them because they're everywhere. Definitely take the ivermectin. Your doctor doesn't know. The permethrin sucks. Ivermectin is what you need. Imagine somebody telling their doctor, hey, doc, uh, I got a second opinion. Uh, and he asks where it's from. And they say, well, it's this guy. His name's Billy Football. Uh, he told me on a podcast that I need this. <laughs> Seriously, it was that, like it was the only way I got rid of them. I only had the cream, but I had like the scariest two weeks of my life when I went to the doctor and I was like, I can't stop itching my dick. Um <laughs> 
And it's like, just like, I'm just like itching it constantly. It's all dried out. And he was like, okay, it could be scabies or it could be herpes. So we're going to have to do a test and we'll let you know what it is in two weeks. And so like for two weeks, I was like, do I have fucking herpes? Like, how the hell did I get herpes? Oh no. Because I hadn't been having like a lot of sex with <laughs> randos at the time. I had done, I'd recently gone on a trip to Miami where I like slept in a couple crappy motels, but I was like, I don't think you can get herpes just from like sleeping in a, in a shitty hotel. Um, and I had like made out with a chick and I'm like, I don't think, but yeah, thankfully it came back. It was scabies. I got it cleared up, uh, but not before giving it to my brother and my brother giving it to his girlfriend. Oh no. Yeah. And then Where the thing is from? if they, you can, I don't know. I've never dude, you can this. keep passing it back and forth with the permethrin yeah. cream. Whereas if you get Iver, like, let's say you're like have a roommate and you have scabies, but then your roommate catches scabies and then you're both using the permethrin cream, but they just jump back and forth between you. If you just take ivermectin, it'll like be over a certain amount of time where all the scabies, when they can't live on a host, they'll be able to die in your room. So you won't be just trading it back and forth. What is the end game of this French guy or this person on French fortune? Was he just doing it just to cause chaos or did he have a political agenda behind it? He wants to destroy the country of France. Yeah. And if like the Olympics are a complete disaster, it will be a horrible look for France. I don't know. Yeah. Might just love, love chaos. This guy sucks. But it's like, who's the superhero who's going to take him down? And really... At this point, is there anything a superhero could do? No, it's the perfect crime. Yeah. What like, France needs is a really cold winter. And there's there now Mr. there's people Freeze. being like <laughs> Yeah. There's one of there's a bunch of people being like, no, bed bugs are spreading because of global warming. Uh, which is probably also true, but they need a really cold <laughs> winter to snap it. Uh, I just want to take a second to acknowledge Big T right now. Big T is being a warrior. Big T's fighting Bro, through this, this shit right now. Fucking sucks. I know. I can tell. I can tell you're struggling. You don't have to stay if you want to go. Like take no, a nap. No, no. I'm can. here. I, I'm built different. Okay. I just want. I want everybody to know right now that Big T's fighting through this. He's I haven't been this sick in years. Yeah. Have you taken any over the counter stuff? Yeah. Can I send you some chicken soup? You don't need to do that. I'd love to send you some Greek chicken soup. I'll be all right. At least your hat's cool. Thanks. Nashville hot chickens. Uh, Big T, you teed off about anything? Uh, yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's got me pretty teed off. Yeah. Um, Are you no, going to get the booster? I'm, hell no. I got the shots that the F man told me I wouldn't get this, and I've gotten it twice now. So. Mm. Same here. Hell of a lot of good that did. The F man. Uh, so okay, you're not teed off about anything, are you? You we got not Tennessee minute I, in you today. I mean, nothing's happened. It's UConn week. Uh, that's very exciting. You know, thirty six <laughs> point favorite should take care of business, and then big game next week against Missouri. Yeah. Was there a new basketball Connor looks Stallions good. update? There actually is a Connor Stallions the update. Michigan? Was it the Michigan? Oh, yeah. yeah. On, on the CMU sideline. Um, and then Jim McElwain, the coach of, of CMU, came out yesterday and he said, yeah, we did not have that person's name on the sideline for that game. We don't know who this is. We're looking into it. It sounds to me like it's definitely him that was there. It did not pass the smell test for me initially. But, like, if it was somebody from Central Michigan, they'd have just said that. Yeah, they so, would know. And did you see the clip of someone runs out of bounds and it's right near him and he like takes his hat and tucks it under so like you can't see him? No, I didn't see that one. And he's also, he was wearing Nike shoes when Central Michigan is an Adidas school and everybody else is wearing Adidas. Hmm. Oh, shit. I, I also saw that there was a uh, maybe a still frame. There might have been a video too that showed a light at the corner of his glasses. And yeah, I saw that. They they identified the glasses he was wearing as being Ray Bans that had a camera built into them. This guy is awesome. What is he doing at CMU though? Like, what's CMU got? That he's That's scouting what I was Michigan Michigan State because oh, is that whom CMU was playing? Yeah, yeah. but like oh. they had he, they that's far more dangerous than just doing what they had been doing 
and sending somebody to sit in the seat. Like, why would he go on the sideline? And it's such a lower, like, ranked op- opponent. It's not like, like if State they game. wanted to help Central Michigan beat them, I guess. But like, nobody would have cared about that. It's not like people. Oh, Michigan State lost Central Michigan. Like, they're dog shit anyway. Michigan State is. Nobody would have cared. He doesn't yeah. have Wait, a line. Were, weren't they playing MSU? Yeah. Yes. So what, wouldn't he be looking for MSU's Correct. signs? But they could yeah. have just done that the way they'd been doing it. What could he it, see when he was down on field level that would not be easier to see up in the stands? Oh, That's he the could have been getting have audibles ourselves. from the quarterback. He may have been trying to record tape. Like of like Pick up audio maybe? Yeah, hot routes and audibles. And how is he getting into like CMU gear and getting on the field. We don't know. Well, we don't so know. three people on the Central Michigan staff, including the head coach, worked with him at Michigan. Mm. Some action. And also, as somebody who uh, has snuck into a dog show before, he could have e- very easily just printed off a fake credential if mm-hmm. he found out what the actual credentials looked like. Because security staff at stadiums, big arenas like that, they will check and they know – like what passes, what color designation that they're allowed to let into certain areas. It'll be like, if there's a red F, that means that you have field access. Right. If there's a green C, that means that you they're have- not scanning anything. You have access to the media center. You have access to these certain areas, but you don't have access to the sidelines. So we probably looked up what those passes looked like mm-hmm. and then printed them off, laminated them, and then- made it look like it was legit. This guy- And if you're wearing a good. central Michigan jacket and hat, like they would just assume- yeah. Yeah, this guy's good. He is also he, he had he had a, what looked like a credential. That was the one thing of the photo. No other coach had a thing around his uh neck. Right, like I've never seen that one. on like Ryan Day. He doesn't have like a field pass on him. Yeah. So when when I uh snuck in, I've snuck into a few things. Donnie, I know you have too. You're pretty experienced at this. But at at Super Bowl Media Day, it's always easier to sneak in to the media area if you sneak in through the crowd. So um, there's a media entrance that you have to get in and they're generally pretty good about checking credentials and making sure everything looks legit if you go in the media entrance. But the media is also allowed to access like the fan area in the stands. So um, a media member can like walk past a small barrier with one guard at it, go up into the stands, interview fans that are there, just taken in the sights from like the top vantage point and then come back down to the media area. So what I would do is I would just get a ticket to like the fan section at media day, then I'd have my fake credential and then I would access the media part by going past that one security guard uh, that stands there. And that guy is typically not as prepared to like look into the detail of things. And there's no, like there's um, like metal detectors and all sorts of stuff that you have to go through if you're going through the media entrance and they check your cameras, all this stuff. But there's none of that. This guy might've just gone down like from the stands and acted like he, went up into the stands for some reason to like bring back a football that got lost in pregame warmups or something yeah. and then came back in. Um, so who knows, who knows, but I will say again, Connor stallions is he's a real go-getter and he's organized. He's meticulous. He's got his shit together. This guy is, uh, is everything that you'd want to have as a member of your staff. He should have his own program. Somebody should, should hire this guy as like the head coach because he's that driven and that crazy. Um, he's not fired, right? Off Michigan. Oh, I'm sure he's he on, is. Like administrative leave or whatever. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sure he's gone. Yeah, <laughs> they're gonna take care yeah, of him though. Will be fired. Okay. I he just be- love this story so much, though. Like, it it seems more likely than not at this point that it screwed Tennessee out of going to the college football playoff, and I still love this story. Like, it's <laughs> the funniest shit ever. It is very funny. I got caught trying to sneak in uh, on the field at a Clemson UNC game. It was the ACC championships. And I was just wearing a Clemson Susie, like a bright orange jacket with a purple lining. And um, I got down and I was with the band and then the band starts marching out and I'm marching with them. And I would have been able to to get out on the field, but one of those band geeks ratted me out. Oh man. So right as we, right as we walk onto the field, this guy grabs me. It's the first time I've ever been put in cuffs, handcuffs me and locks me in like this tiny room in the stadium. He's oh, like Jesus. He's like, you're like officially under arrest for trespassing. Um and, and Dabo comes in and grills you. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to you spend- know they, they arrested our good Lord Jesus Christ too. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Did you see his rant? There was a godsend that um, so many other people there got in trouble that they ran out of space in the cells. And so after a quarter, he goes, all right, you can leave. We have to, we have to put someone else in this room for like <laughs> doing something a lot worse than trying to get on the field. <laughs> you got saved by somebody else yep. breaking the law harder than you. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't get arrested, but I got a, like a five-year ban from Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte. Oh, that's tough. Did that's you tough. see Dabo go on a rant? Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was amazing. I, I actually don't disagree with Dabo, yeah. or at least his premise behind it, which was like this guy, Tyler from Spartanburg, is spoiled because we've won th- – how many national titles? Have three? Two. Two? Two in seven years? Or they they went to three national championship games in seven years, right? Yeah, and they got yeah. killed by LSU, but they won right. too. That's right. Yeah. So they, Dabo was saying like we've been to three natties in seven years, and we haven't been in like a hundred years or something like that. And you guys are spoiled now, and you expect way too much, and you're part of the problem. Dabo's not incorrect that Clemson fans have become spoiled by success, but that's natural. That happened. That's not like a Clemson thing that happens everywhere. Anytime you get expectations, then you get pissed off. You have like an average year. Same as Pats fans. Same as Pats fans. Yeah. Good point. And and Dabo was very upset at this caller, uh, Tyler from Spartanburg, and called him a smart ass, which is not something that you would ever expect Dabo to say. He definitely wasn't that incorrect in what he was saying, but also you probably shouldn't be going on a five minute rant on a radio caller. Like when you're the head coach at Clemson, like he should have said, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, Tyler. Obviously, this season sucks. We're doing our best, but we've won a lot. And like, give me, I hate Dabo, but like he's earned a bad year. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. And he's still talking about the radio caller right now. Um, Yeah, he did it yesterday in his press conference. He talked about it again. Yeah. John Rich wrote a a great blog on Barstool about about Dabo and, and what he's what he's going through right now, and also uh, mostly sports with Mark Titus. They did a very, very funny video uh, on Dabo Ween where they, they wore the Clemson gloves. Hickory dickory duck. The mouse ran up the clock. Coach Sweeney got that drill, and now he's on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Dabo Ween. Oh, yes. And if you haven't seen... I had not seen the original video from Dabo Swinney on, uh, it was from May 2020. Oh, that's an he, all-timer. I had, ne- I had never seen that when he signed up for TikTok and he goes, hickory dickory doc, the mouse went up the clock. Coach Dabo's got, or no, he says. Coach Swinney's got Co- that drip Coach and now Sweeney's he's on TikTok. Got, and, yeah, and then he shows like the Clemson gloves. It's, uh, I'm actually going to play it out loud right now yeah Um, i haven't seen that either just just listen to him just listen to this guy hickory dickory doc the mouse ran up the clock coach sweeney's got that drip and now he's on tiktok (laughs) he sounds cooler than i thought he would (laughs) yeah (laughs) covid tiktok yep yeah (laughs) covid really did make everybody insane this is probably the craziest thing that happened is is Dabo Swinney went on got on TikTok? Oh God, what a time! The fact, have, did you listen to? So everybody heard what Dabo said. Did you hear the call? Yeah, yeah, from Tyler. The call was insane, and it was like three minutes long. I couldn't believe they let him go that long. Yeah, and Dabo was like, "I'm not going to sit here and let Tyler from Spartanburg talk to talk on my program like that. You can't get on the phone and say that mess." Yeah, it was great. I just college football is the only only sport where you can get these like crazy, crazy storylines and you can't predict the next wild story because it's it's just it's too many uh absolute psychopaths that are fans of the team. Um there's too many like weird plays that happen, too many weird characters around the sport. It's just the most unpredictable sport in the world, which is why you should love That's it. That's why it's the best. Yeah. Uh Big T, can you rank your favorite college football scandals i mean the way stallions is going that's number one i don't like obviously these have to be on field right because there's like some dark shit like i yeah, don't not, really rem- i'm gonna say like the yeah, the funny gonna- the funniest scandals connor stallions obviously number one um 
shout out. It was the anniversary yesterday. Pole Assassin. Yeah, that's you remember my second Pole favorite. Assassin. That was I, awesome. I actually um, so Pole Assassin was the um, exotic dancer who was the wife of one of the assistant coaches at the University of Texas. Pole Assassin had a pet monkey that she would bring onto stage with her and and help her with her dances. And on Halloween two years ago, um, her monkey bit allegedly a trick or treater in Austin. And it became a big thing because she wasn't really supposed to have this monkey. And there was a lot of shit that was going down. Uh, I reached out to her for comment and then she went on to like immediately incriminate herself on Twitter being like the kids were not supposed to be there. And initially the party line was there was no monkey. There was no bite. But then she was like, no, the kids weren't supposed to be there. It was clearly marked with a sign. And then like 30 minutes later, she took a video of her side yard with a sign that she very obviously had just drawn up and put on her fence saying like, no children, no trespassing, emotional support monkey past this place. And uh, it was, that's such a funny story. I agree with Big T. That might be my number two. I remember trying to think of others off the top of my head, Uh, but it's just uh, like crab legs. Oh, James Winston, James Winston's crab legs. Yeah. Manti Teo. Oh, oh, Manti Teo was, that was wild. Yeah. Um, But now we feel bad for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, But at the time, I still think that he should have, he should have known that something weird was going on, but it wasn't Mm. his fault. Like he kind of got played. Well, it was crazy. I mean, it turns out that long distance thing is pretty typical in Mormon. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of like missionary work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but still, like you, sh- he should have figured it out, but he didn't, and it was, whatever. It was too early I, in the internet culture, and we're like yeah, college sure. kids, and you're not that you don't have that much experience with no. long distance relationships or anything like that. And I kind of sympathize for him. Mm. Yeah, because he was being sent photos like the, yeah. that of a girl yeah of a girl and he'd be like send me a photo of you holding up this so i know you're real and then that they actually got a photo of her holding it up yeah uh, uh other great scandals stories in college football history joey freshwater was a pretty good one yeah yeah that's who lane. i was for halloween there's a lot of stories about lane confirmed and otherwise yeah it's just a great sport uh, so we're going to get into the Ottoman Empire here in a second. Billy, I had a question for you. Yes, sir. What's your favorite energy drink pre-workout or otherwise? C4. Oh, you got it right there. C4 awesome. energy. I literally ripped two scoops this morning. Love it. That's, how, that's why you were able to work out so hard. Billy was so focused and locked in on his workout this morning that he forgot to do his job. And it's because C4 is the best thing that you can ever take before a workout you just get laser locked in on your workout. You get a great pump in. How's your pump, Billy? My pump was amazing this morning. I actually, I might send a pump pump pick to the group chat right yeah, now. Please do. Uh, Billy, why don't you take this, this C4 read from here? And I'm going to excuse myself to use the restroom so we can get into Ottoman Empire hard when I get back. Maybe a little Byzantine Empire too? Yeah. yeah let's The precursor? Aren't we doing Istanbul? Well, yeah, Istanbul as the capital of the Ottoman Empire. So we can just kind of, you know, go from there. Well, but before we get into that, let me talk to you about C4 Ultimate Energy. For the big game, the all-nighter, and the days that act like nights, we work hard, play harder, and do it all bigger and better than the rest. Formulated with 300 milligrams of caffeine, Ultimate Energy packs an extra punch and breaks boundaries. Just ask little Yachty, who uses C4 Ultimate Energy to help fuel him on tour this fall. With zero sugar, no artificial flavors, C4 Ultimate provides supercharged energy in a delicious flavors such as orange cream, fruit punch, freedom ice, and arctic snow cone. My favorite is free freedom ice tastes like the rocket pop from all those summers at the ice cream truck c4 ultimate energy get supercharged at c4energy.com or find it near you at findc4.com all right shall we get into this let's do it so the ottoman empire the byzantine empire just just so that we can set up um what we're talking about here the ottoman empire began in 1298 that's the reign of osman the first the founder of the Ottoman Empire, 1298 AD, and it technically lasted until, was it 19... 
1924. Yeah, it, it came to an end when they uh, lost World War One. Yeah, it was after the Treaty of Lasagna. It's actually Lausanne, uh, but I prefer to call it the Treaty of Lasagna. And that was post World War One, and then um, the Ottoman Empire finally came to its end. But Donnie, you want to talk about the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, which was the precursor? Yes, you can't talk about Istanbul without talking about Constantinople. And um, I will stand by this take: the Roman Empire didn't end until 1453, because the Byzantine Empire pretty much it was a continuation of the Roman Empire. They referred to themselves as the Romans. Um, other people at that time, like thought of them as the Roman empire, uh, the, the term Byzantine empire was only invented in like the 1800s or something just as a way to talk about the Eastern Roman empire. I did not know that. Yeah. So it was when the Roman empire started to get really big, they were like, okay, we need a more central location to like manage all of it. And so emperor Constantine, he founded Constantinople. Because it was right in the middle of Europe and Asia on mm -hmm. the Bosphorus Straits, which is the most strategic point on Earth, really. Because, yeah. There's one competition, I think. Suez Canal? Uh, strategic, but like best geographic location for a city due to like port space, navigable waters. I'd argue New York City is the only one that rivals it with its amazing natural port. Yeah, New York City, but like in ancient times, right? Like, yeah, there was no point in having a, a port in New York. But yeah, after U.S. took off, New York's got a great location, huge harbor, sheltered from the ocean. Um, but yeah, so he founded that, and then um, eventually the Western Roman Empire was kind of taken over by Germanic tribes, but the Eastern Roman Empire survived. So, like a lot of the noblemen in Rome and the aristocracy, aristocracy, how do you say that? Aristocracy? Aristocracy. Aristocracy. Aristocracy, like the, the Roman aristocracy kind of just like moved to Constantinople. So it was a direct continuation of the Roman empire. And so when uh, the Western Roman empire went to the dogs, uh, Byzantine, uh, Byzant or Constantinople and the surrounding Eastern Roman empire thrived. And they thrived for a long time. At one point, Emperor Justinian, uh, based in Constantinople, he actually took over parts of Spain, took over large parts of Italy, and almost like reclaimed most of the original Roman Empire. Was Justinian, he was the guy that first like codified law, right? He, he wrote down what yeah. all the laws were. Yeah, and I, so I think you're right about know. that. Yep. Because there was um, the draconian code which is just basically i'm gonna kill everybody that doesn't agree with me or that i don't like yeah and then justinian had like a, a uniform uh system of law mm -hmm. that everybody had to follow kind of crazy to think that we didn't have that before then yeah i think that's where you get the word justice oh that From would make justinian sense code oh, another shit. fun fact the roman continuation in the byzantine empire sort of that's why romania gets its name romania because they sort of consider themselves the spiritual successor of the Byzantine Empire, and they're also Romans. Huh. Yeah, actually, the Romanian language is one of the Romance languages. So it like it was a it uh, directly came from Latin, just like French and Spanish. Uh, one difference between Constantinople and Rome is that Rome had the Colosseum, and Constantinople they had the Hippodrome, where it's like a big chariot racetrack. That's so. Sick. Rome loved their gladiator battles. Constantinople loved their chariot races. So when kind you of think like NASCAR down south, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you think Ottoman, you might think of the furniture, and it does actually come from the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. So they designed their rooms, especially in the palaces, that had very low profile seats, like padded seats, but they were around like the entire outside of the room. So okay. all the walls had their little like area that they could sit on, and then they started to make them smaller and smaller where it was just eventually just one corner or every corner would have these things that you could sit on. Okay. And then that got, that idea got uh, picked up by Western Europe and they made it into just like a, a floating chair that could sit anywhere in the room. 
I most underrated item. piece of furniture, in my opinion. An ottoman, it's great. It's so versatile. You can sit on it. You can. Everybody appreciates the chair, the couch. Ottoman doesn't get a lot of love. It's a yeah, like you said, versatility. Yeah, you can use it as a footrest. I'll tell you what, Blake loves the ottoman. That's his favorite place. So at night we watch TV. Blake watches football with me, and he's got the, we've got a big couch down in our basement, which I absolutely love. But his favorite cushion by far is the giant ottoman. That it, so he'll just he'll seek that one out. He'll go lay down on every cushion, be like, no, nope, not the one, no, nope, not the one. Gets on the ottoman. He's like, yep, this is my shit. This is my jam right now. Love a good ottoman. Yeah. So speaking of the ottomans, they were kind of the first people to. Um... They were the first people to uh, conquer Constantinople because the Eastern Roman Empire, it was thriving for a long time. Um, and then slowly the Ottoman Empire started taking bits and pieces of it until all that was left was Constantinople. Yeah. And it was pretty much the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire just surrounded the little tip of the peninsula there. And it was like the last remnant of the Byzantine Empire. And finally, the reason they couldn't take it down is because it had like the most impressive walls of all time. They were called the Theodosian walls. Yeah. And it just like blocked off the whole peninsula. They were the thickest walls of all time. And for like five, 500, 700 years, no one could get past those walls. Yeah. Well, and then, quick, quick correction, yeah. Donnie. Because oh, this yeah. is one of my favorite facts about Constantinople is that it was sacked before the Ottomans. The Fourth Crusade. The Fourth Crusade. Let me just steal this one tidbit because yes. in the early 13th century, prior to getting to Jerusalem, the armies of the Crusades were, you know, they were taking so long to travel back then. And if you know anything about the Crusades, it's basically a bunch of these knights who are just like, you know, chomping at the bit to get some action and the pope was just like yo stop fighting each other and turning europe into a war zone every two seconds go go do something productive you know go take back the holy land so they were going and basically they were so hyped up they just like basically got to constantinople and uh sacked it when they didn't get paid uh to help uh fight off arab states that were trying to take it over so they sacked the city in 1204 and established a Latin state. But then in 1261, the Byzantines reclaimed it. Yeah, that was wild. It was it was all the crusaders being like, we're gonna fight the Muslims, we're gonna regain Jerusalem. And then on the way over, they met this guy who claimed to be like a heir to the Byzantine throne. And he was like, if you help put me back on the throne, I will give you guys all of the money and ships you need to take over Jerusalem. And so they were like, okay, sounds good. We kind of hate the Byzantines just because they're way richer than us. We'll help you. And yeah, managed to conquer the city. And then after they put that guy on the throne, he was like, oh, we're actually completely broke. We have no money to pay you. And so then they just sacked the whole city and took it over. Um, so yeah, dark times. And then actually Venice took a lot of the treasures back to Venice because the there was a huge group of Venetians um, amongst the crusaders. So now in Venice, they have these giant horses on top of the main church there. And those were just stolen from Constantinople. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, but okay. Eventually the, the Byzantines regained control and it wasn't until the Ottomans that, uh, it was taken over for good. And one of the reasons they were able to take it over is the Sultan Mehmed, maybe he built one of the largest cannons of all time. Um, it took like 400 men to move. It's about like 25 feet long. Um, and it was the first, and he just hammered the walls and even the walls were so strong that it took him like weeks of just constant hammer, uh, constant hammering. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of people inside the city at the time. So they were doing a good job of holding them off. But once that cannon made a small hole in the walls, they were finally able to just swarm in and take it over. And that's when it became, that's when it became Istanbul. That's I crazy. I was reading about that guy, uh, the Sultan. You don't hear about Sultans a lot, but Sultan sneaky, like a top three coolest thing you could ever be. Yeah. And they, they had great names too. So it was Mehmed the Conqueror yeah. was his name. Alexander the Great is also just a fantastic name. 
Like it's simple to the point. We don't do that type of stuff anymore. Like just give people those nicknames. There was another guy that was called, um, let's see, it was uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. That might be my favorite name. Suleiman, yes. They also oh, had harems. Yeah, yeah so harems okay. are pretty insane. It, 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 so let, they let, still let's let's get into that in a second because I do have a lot of stuff I want to talk talk about when it comes to like the uh, the concubines. But um, let's go back real quick to Mehmed the Third. So before Mehmed the Third took over, um, there was no direct line of ascension that was put in place. So this is what kind of threw things into chaos for the, for the empire for a long ass time. Like in Rome, uh, I believe it was the firstborn son would always take over at first, but then they just chose that if you were the emperor, you could just choose who you want to be. Okay. Like even if it wasn't your son, but you just had to pick someone. But in, in, uh, the Ottoman empire, they didn't really have a designated line of succession. So what would happen would be every time a Sultan would die, their sons would typically fight for the right to become the next sultan and they would kill each other the the Bayezid sons they fought each other for 14 years and eventually it led to fratricide which is like killing your brother um so like kids sometimes would kill their brothers so that they would have an easier time to get to the throne when their dad died and uh Mehmed the third after his dad died he killed 19 of his brothers yeah. And uh, just like publicly executed all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think it was after that point where they were like, you know what? Um, this has gotten a little bit out of hand with with people killing their brothers to become sultans. So they they eventually switched over to allowing them to just simply arrest and imprison their brothers. Yeah. In a, a very nice palace. Yeah. They were pretty much locked in a palace. And couldn't leave their whole lives. It was a super nice palace. Yeah. Like it looked it looked like a great place to live, except you weren't allowed to leave. Sometimes you weren't allowed to go outside at all. But you um I think most of the brothers that ended up living there, they eventually like drank themselves to death or it would fuck you up. They just went insane. Because yeah, you, if weren't you were like locked anything. in a mansion your whole life and you could have like all the food you want, all of the women you want, like You'd, you'd survive, but you would come out of that place a nut job. Yeah. It sounds like a great vacation. Yeah, I would I would love to do that for a week. But just doing <laughs> yeah. that for life, not going outside, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. So they, um, they, they eventually kind of relaxed those laws a little bit. Uh, and there were some sultans that were pretty, um, pretty vindictive. There was one guy, I believe his name was Salim. Uh, and he was a sultan and he had all of his advisors around him. So like the top people in, in the, um, in the courts were called viziers or viziers. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but that's like when you get elevated to be like on the King's council or on the Sultan's council, trusted advisor. Uh, and there was an insult that would go around where people would say to people that they don't like, may you one day become vizier of Salim, mm -hmm. meaning I hope that one day you'll become a trusted advisor to the Sultan. Um, but he would just kill them after he became upset with them. So that they would typically last a year or two. Yeah. And then he would be like, no, I don't like this guy anymore. We're going to execute him and we're going to kill him. It was like, uh, it's like wishing if somebody, if I didn't like you, I'd be like, Donnie, I hope you one day become producer of the Kirk Minahan show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and knowing that like, okay, you're, you might enjoy yourself for a little bit, but just, yeah. wait, just wait. Or like become coach of, who's a team that just constantly fires their coach? The Raiders. Okay, yeah. I hope you one day become <laughs> coach of the Raiders. The drummer for Spinal Tap. I hope you'll okay. get to drum for them one day. Um, Did the Viziers have to chop off their nuts to be like the closest advisor? That Those were the guards. So Ooh, uh, yeah. those were... Yeah, the Janissaries. The Janissaries. Yeah, they were the elite group of infantry bodyguards. So at first there were only like a thousand of them and then they grew eventually. But the ones that worked for like in the court, they were all eunuchs. So they had to cut off their balls and that was one so that they wouldn't have kids and they wouldn't have families of their own. Therefore they would be more loyal to the Sultan. Yes. And then two, because the Sultans were surrounded by concubines all the time and the Sultan didn't want anybody else banging their whores. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to cut your nuts off in order to prove that you were loyal to them. And yeah, the Janissaries. Now, a fact also, about the Janissaries is they were all 
kidnapped Christians, usually from the Balkans, because the Ottomans conquered all, all of the Balkans. So they would just like tell the people there, like, you have to give us one of your kids. And yeah. then they would kind of like raise them in the palace to just become warriors. Yeah. Uh, I think they would have to convert to Islam. And then, yeah, they were the elite troops. From like a the, very, very young age. That's all they were trained yeah. on is like how to be a warrior. Yeah. And also that's why like, we don't hear about the Ottoman Empire slave trade. They're like the slave trade in the Ottoman Empire was really widespread. They took tons of slaves from both Europe and Africa of all different types of people. But because they uh, sterilized all of them, most of their, their, they don't have any descendants. So they have no one to like really talk about their history. Mm -hmm. I'm going to really blow your guys' mind right now. The word slave comes from Slav because yeah. they would kidnap the Slavs. Uh, the Slavic people were the people who lived in the Balkans. Oh, that's wild. And then they would turn them into slaves. So um, that's, a tough, yeah. uh, that's a tough thing to have named for you. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, Slavs, the original slaves. And so the Slav squat? The Slav. Yeah, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but the Slavs are very good at squatting. <laughs> Almo are? Almost as almost as good as Asians. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and smoking cigarettes and drinking vodka and playing mm -hmm. dice. They like that stuff. I think they would make a good like elite warrior troop because just imagine a bunch of huge Serbians and Albanians. Like the, that's the Jokic brothers. Jokic, yeah, yeah. coming at you. Uh, they would. Uh, they had. A very interesting method of execution. So the vis the viziers, if you were to be sentenced to be executed, they had like an arena that they would put you in and they would bring out a drink to you. And uh, the drink would either be white or it would be red. If it was white, then you were pardoned and you could probably live in exile. If it was red, it meant that you were sentenced to death. And when you saw the red drink, you had two options. One, you stand there and you get executed by a gardener. So the gardeners were the executioners and the gardeners were like the biggest, most jacked up dudes in the court. And they would hire these gardeners specifically to be also executioners, like the most intimidating guys. So you would, you would look at your drink. If it was red, a gardener would come out and he would have like usually a dagger, a sword, or sometimes a, uh, a bowstring that he would use to, to suffocate you. When you saw that drink, they opened the gate, the gardener steps in, you could then try to run. You could try to run and escape. They gave you an opportunity to escape. And usually the viziers were old dudes, so they weren't super fast. Yeah. And the gardeners were just like the most in shape dudes in the entire land. Yeah. Um, but you would, you would be able to try to run out of the arena, run down the hallway, run through the gardens, like a maze like garden to escape and you had a jacked up gardener chasing after you. And then all the concubines would get out on the balconies because they knew that this was about to happen. And it would be like a sporting event where they would watch this terrified old guy try to run away from the gardener. And <laughs> it's American gladiator. It is. And a couple guys made it. A couple guys escaped him, but most, most of the time they would be killed pretty quickly. But um, there was one dude that escaped all the way. And then he's granted his freedom or sometimes he would get put into the, the palace prison. Um, but this one guy ended up becoming like a governor of a big state in the Ottoman Empire after he escaped execution because they respected him so much for defeating the gardener. But yeah, that's the that's the craziest thing, isn't uh, it? Yeah, I would not want to face the gardener. No. <laughs> I think what they would usually do, actually, no, this is when they were committing fratricide. It was against a lot of spill royal blood. So they would always strangle them with like a, a silk handkerchief or something like that. Yeah. So that you kill them, but no blood is spilled. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would not want to face off against the gardener. No. W were they all concubines or were they technically wives in the harems? So they were concubines, but the sultans generally only procreated with concubines, not their wives. So the sultan would have a wife probably to consolidate power. It was like a strategic marriage where it was like, okay, this person is the daughter of this person who's very important from here. So it makes sense to marry, but um, they typically only had babies with their concubines and the sultan's mom would usually decide if there was like a woman that wanted to be a concubine 
the concubine would interview with the sultan's mom to give her the thumbs up or the thumbs down as to whether or not she was good enough to bang her son. And from what I read, it turns out a lot of the mothers also tried to kill other sons of other concubines because if they became if their son became king the next sultan they would get such high esteem and also get to choose the next concubines good point so so they would make they would like groom their sons to try to kill other sons of other women's concubines of other concubines like in order to make sure they got that esteemed role girl boss yeah girl boss energy now, speaking of the concubines, did you guys hear the story of the one Sultan who loved BBWs? No. <laughs> All right, he was obsessed with fat women. So he sent out his servants to find the fattest woman in the empire and then made her his like main wife. Um, just like, yeah, just loved chicks as large as possible. Uh, this is a, it's a true story. Her name was a uh, Sivakar Sultan. And I think her nickname was like piece of sugar or something like that. (laughs) Um, I think they have some historical photos of her. Uh, There was one, I don't know if it was real, because one of the photos, she looked rough. Like not just because she was fat, just because she looked like a man as well. Um, But yeah, I mean... Imagine getting the knock at your door. Yeah. It's like, hey, I've heard you're I've heard you're real fat. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure back in the day, fat women like weren't as common. So, you know, it was more of a novelty. Yeah. Sign uh, of wealth. Yeah. People don't understand like so much so much of Europe was conquered by the Ottoman Empire. Like Greece was under Ottoman control. Oh yeah. Um, um, the most closest, of the Balkans. they, and like the farthest they got was, uh, Vienna, which they sieged, they sieged Vienna and like almost took it over. I think, I think the Polish came to the rescue of all people. There was like a famous Polish cavalry charge where they were the ones to scare them away. Um, a theory though is, is that Europe was introduced to coffee from the Ottomans. Uh-huh. Um, because after they retreated from Vienna, they like went out into the fields and they found all this left leftover coffee. They didn't really know what it was. And then soon after that, coffee became popular in the rest of Europe. Just that they discovered it and they're like, Hey, check this out. This is awesome. Yeah. Good. Which is like wild that before then, just like Europeans didn't have caffeine and then Get they kind of like show... Yeah, they, they had booze, but then they showed, they're like, okay, after Europe found caffeine, they became like a lot more productive. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, Like they got more done. They planned things out more meticulously. There was like way more foresight into how they built their cities. Yeah. And it's all traced back to coffee. Doing yeah. doing a macro dosing on coffee would probably be a good idea too. Yeah, that'd be so great. Should. should we have Big Hat on? Yeah, have him talk about <laughs> coffee. The yeah. history of coffee. Um yeah, I just like I found a bit. It was like the the uh, the fattest woman in the uh, in the harem, Ibrahim, baby. There were a couple of sultans that married their favorite concubines too. Mm-hmm. That was typically not the case, but there were one or two that were like, you know what this this girl she gets it. And uh, if you wanted to become a concubine, you had to go to concubine school. So you would apply through the mom, and then you would get admitted to the school. And then they would teach you in like classes about all the things that the Sultan likes, the things that he dislikes, and then you would practice. I don't know. I don't know how intense those practices got if they like had simulated like, Hey, he really likes, he loves being pegged. So, um, we're going to, we're going to spend two hours with a strap on. You're going to learn how to do that. But yeah, you had to practice and train to become a concubine. So some of the biggest harems for the concubines, like had the Topkapi Palace under the Ottoman Empire, which was the imperial harem, had 400 rooms. And at their height, uh, they had over 40, no, that can't be right. 40,000 concubines? That's too many concubines. No, that might've been in the history of the Ottomans. 
Okay. Yeah, because I don't. Would it even be possible to have sex with forty thousand women in in one lifetime? Will Chamberlain? He said a hundred thousand, right? Or no? Let's see how many. Did no, he scored a hundred points in a game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He um, had sex ten thousand, I think. Ten thousand, I could see that would that would be doable. Twenty thousand women. If you couldn't, like, you have so many concubines, like some probably never had a night with them. Yeah, so they were encouraged to not sleep with the same woman twice. Yeah, That's so I'm sure some of them one night. Some of them probably did because you're like it got me thinking. Booty got me thinking. Go back to it. But, uh, yeah, you just go, you just kind of hop along like a frog in a lily pad, just one woman every night. They had six to 800 eunuchs serving in the harem at the height of their power. So would they cut off their, like, nuts. everything? No, just oh, the nuts. Yeah, only the nuts. Okay. So some of those concubines may have been getting some sterile penis. Do you still get a boner if you don't have nuts? I think, well, I th like my dog still gets boners and he's neutered. Good point. I think I remember hearing that when, when they would chop off your nuts, you would like stop growing a beard or something like that. That's why like when you watch Game of Thrones, a lot of the eunuchs are really like smooth. No facial hair. They're smooth. Yeah. Um, you lose your testosterone though, right? Yeah. But I think your body still produces a little bit of testosterone, just not from your, like they're, like the same way women have testosterone, but no testicles. Like women have a very small amount. Yeah. Let I me bet look the, up the science on that. I bet the concubines were were banging each other too. Yeah. If they only got one night with a sultan. Oh, for sure. Well, I mean, that's well, just like giant orgies when the sultan's not around. Yeah, probably. Although I was reading that one time someone – in the concubine banged another man and the sultan was so mad that he had just all of the concubines drowned like oh my god 300 drowned um so yeah it was a rough life i don't think i'd want to really be in the royal court of the ottomans sounds like a lot of pressure yeah it's fine with just being a normal dude or just like a guy several hundred years later that's talking about it that's yeah way, that's, that's way better that's even better um but yeah, the Ottoman Empire lasted for a long time. I mean, they started to kind of modernize a bit. Um, and so when we have all like the modern nations of France, UK, mm -hmm. Germany, the Ottoman Empire was still around, but they were kind of, they weren't as strong. For a while, they were the strongest power in Europe. Because they had such a, a strategic place that it was like impossible to conquer. Yeah. And they they conquered a lot of land. Like they were uh, in control of Persia, Iraq, uh, where Israel, Palestine is now, Egypt. Um, they controlled all of that. And then in World War One, have you guys ever seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia? I have not seen that. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Well, it's all it's based on a true story. Uh, the Brits like sent this special special agent to the Middle East to like rile up the Arabs there to rebel against the Ottoman Empire because then it would like weaken them while they were fighting them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked. That's kind of like how the creation of the modern Middle East came to be because uh, that guy and just the Brits in general made all these deals with the Arabs there being like, if you help us fight the Ottomans, then um, we'll kind of make you guys the de facto rulers of this area. Whoa. Don't forget um, the Fez hats. We yes. haven't mentioned the Fez hats once in this discussion, but the Ottomans, there's actually a very funny viral video going around now of a guy in a Fez hat, which is a red hat that looks like a, a very small bucket turned on. It's looks like a very small bucket turned on its head and it has like a little uh, ribbon attached to it, like black mm -hmm. string almost. And there's a video of a guy walking around in a fez hat in like a typical Ottoman uh, gear around Greece and all these Greeks. If you didn't know, the Greeks and the Turks have like huge beef going back to the Ottoman Empire. And like people are just looking at him like pissed off as hell. And mm -hmm. it's a very funny video. 
Um, uh, it's so, like an ancient beef that dates back to literally like tr- Greece and Troy. I love the Trojans are technically the Trojans were uh, the set where they think Troy was originally was on uh, Anatolia, Anatolia. And the Turks like to say that's where they fell into the classical antiquity of uh, the region. No. Hmm. The Turks, no, the, the Turks came from Turkmenistan, which is like Central Asia. And then they came down into Anatolia and started pushing out the Byzantines. Oh, that's so, how it started. So where was their capital city before they had They were just like roving nomads. But uh, for a while it was, I think, um, Ankara, maybe? I don't It's somewhere in Anatolia. Huh. Um, One of my favorite stories, I did a lot of research on Istanbul because that's where we left off in the group chat for research. But one of my favorite stories about Istanbul is that uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, asked for research to be done on this place, the uh, Basilica Cistern, which was a cistern built back by the Byzantines. And it was this, it's got really nice columns, all sorts of stuff. But one of the greatest uh, cornerstones of it is that there's literally columns with upside down Medusa heads. And as the story goes, uh, a document was found because they're trying to figure out where these Medusa heads came from. Uh, They found this document that inspired researchers and it was a diary kept by Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who ruled the Ottoman Empire from uh, 1876 to 1909, and tells an interesting story uh, about a delegation that was sent from Venice in 1456 to meet with the Sultan, uh, Mehmet. They demanded to meet with the Sultan because they said that there was a sarcophagus in the uh, cistern that had the body of Medusa. So... And did they yeah. find it? <laughs> so they then, according to this document, uh, the Sultan went to investigate. They found a sarcophagus and they removed it. And the sarcophagus was supposedly found in one of the corridors. And according to legend, when the sarcophagus was opened up, the mummy of a terrifying creature was uncovered. It had a human head, but its entire body curved like a giant snake. Some have speculated that the creature wasn't Medusa, but was the mythical creature Shah Maran, which originated in Iran, but is a popular mythological creature in Turkey. Much like Medusa, she is part human, part snake. Some have even speculated that Medusa and Shah Maran are actually the same woman. So there's literally like documentation from the 1400s that, you know, was sort of revisited in the early uh, 20th century that says they found the body of Medusa in the cistern, uh, which is like the the basilica. Wait, yeah. It's like this really cool place underneath the ground in Istanbul that has like like a little bit of water. And I think it's supposed to be sort of like a a, a reservoir of sorts. And it has these huge fish living in it. And basically... They Medusa may have been buried there. I went to that place actually. Now that um, I had a layover in Turkey, and shout out Turkish Airlines. They're like, if you have a layover, we'll pay for you to get, to have like a full tour of the city. We'll grab you breakfast, lunch, and free admission into like four of the of the biggest tourist attractions. That's cool. Also, great food on Turkish Airlines. Oh yeah, and very comfortable seats. Yeah, I asked for a snack thinking I would get like a bag of pretzels and it was like this mozzarella tomato prosciutto sandwich. Yeah, they're great. Really they comfortable. Are, we're going Egypt Air. Well, yeah, Egypt Air is not not good. <laughs> not good. <laughs> I was like, I got my is it safe? Up. I mean, safe, but I don't think. I think a, a plane crash is the least thing I'm worried about. Yeah. Ethiopian Airlines had a, a couple crashes, but that was Boeing's fault. That not, was the, the 737- max yes. right yeah um do you guys know about the battle of gallipoli in world war one not really that's when the uk and australia and new zealand forces i think there was probably actually no american forces we hadn't entered the war yet but they got their asses handed to them by the ottoman empire we we tried to in, uh invade the they tried to invade invade the dardanelles which is like the straits right south of 
uh, Istanbul, and it was a sea invasion, sea to land invasion, and similar to D Day, except they lost and just got like like I don't know how many casualties, but it was a bloodbath, and. I think still to this day, it's the battle where Australian and New Zealand troops lost the most people. Oh, crazy. It's uh, kind of Churchill's fault. Yeah. Churchill is blamed for it. What did he do? He was oh, like- Oh, it, it was his idea. And he was just like, all right, we're going to roll up. We're going to invade here. They're not going to put up a fight. But they put up one hell of a fight. And how many, like, so there's actually a huge monument there now that- uh, is in honor of all the like Australians and New Zealanders who lost their life. Oh, it's, um, uh, Anzac it's one of the reasons why yeah. Churchill drank so heavily. Like you may have heard the Burt Kreischer bit about Winston Churchill day where he just drinks like Winston Churchill did all day and eats and does all that, you know, gluttony. Yeah. He literally was drinking away the pain of losing like thousands of thousands of people. He took it to heart. So um, some other innovations from the Ottoman Empire, they were big into astronomy. So one of the astronomers there, Ali Kushij, Kushji, Ali something, uh, he managed to make the first map of the moon, which is pretty cool. So um, that was back like way, way, way back there in the 1500s, I think. They built a massive observatory Um with like some of the most uh, advanced technological uh, like telescopes and things like that. And they started to calculate the orbit of the sun or the earth around the sun. So they could, they could show like how it wasn't like a constant perfect uh, circle around. And there were like variations to it that they were able to, to describe. And um, yeah, I think in 1580, uh, they destroyed the observatory. I'm not exactly sure why they destroyed it, but then things kind of fell off after that. But they had a good, I think, 400 year span where they were like the leaders in astronomy. There, um, they were big into medicine. Like you said, they they were into coffee. They used coffee um, as a stimulant, and they used it to uh, treat fatigue, exhaustion, and they had doctor's offices like everywhere so in like the big markets you just go see the doctor doctors would come to your homes they were pretty advanced medically at the time considering what else was going on they were also been big into physics um i still don't understand anything about physics but they don't get a lot of credit for some of the work that they put forward there and they made some really intense clocks and they were innovators when it came to steam power okay uh, yeah the they, physics makes sense that's how they were able to like build the largest gun of all time. Yep. Yep. The military was like, they, they use most of their physical um, knowledge in terms of making weapons. The Dardanelles gun was designed and cast in bronze in 1464 by Munir Ali, weighed nearly a ton and had a length of five meters. The large gun operated a 635 millimeter caliber round, was able to fire marble boulders. Yeah. That's crazy. What an elegant way to, to get your head blown off. <laughs> and I think those boulders could go one mile. Like it, it could shoot a boulder a mile in distance, which is wild. That is crazy. They had great steel too, Damascus steel. And they um, were instrumental in the breeding of Anatolian shepherds. Oh, huh. I don't know if I know those dogs. That's it, Blake is a cool Anatolian shepherd. Oh, okay. Yeah. So fun fact about Anatolian shepherds. They're designed to be like livestock, livestock guard dogs. And um, I think it was, what country was it? I think it was, um, it was somewhere in Africa. I'll look it up real quick here. Namibia. So in 1994, Namibian farmers were dealing with like a massive problem of cheetah attacks. There were, I think the average was each farmer was killing 19 cheetahs per year that were hunting their livestock. So they sent 300 Anatolian shepherds to Namibia. And since then, the, ch the number of cheetahs killed by farmers has dropped from 19 per farmer annually to two and a half, which is pretty wild. Like that just dogs can, I guess the cheetahs get scared of these big dogs. Yeah. Like those dogs can't outrun a cheetah, but they don't have to. They don't have to. Just their mere presence. Yeah. It's like, hmm. move along, buddy. 
scares them away. Is Istanbul was still uh, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, even after the Ottomans took it over. Yeah, Ottomans I mean, very religiously uh, tolerant. I mean, they still have the giant church was from the Byzantine Empire. It's still around and it is freakishly big. Yeah, the uh, Hagia, Hagia Sophia. Yeah, the like when was that built? Because it's crazy. Like, I think it was because it's still to this day. It's like, how the fuck did they make this? Oh, it was completed in five thirty seven A D. It is um, now a mosque. Yeah, turned into a mosque when the Istanbuls took it over. But when you see that thing, you're just like blown away that they could make it so long ago. It just dominates the skyline. Also. Um, uh, the Ottoman Turks may have also done some pretty bad stuff to the Armenians. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if yeah, the Armenian genocide. If, if we so when I said they that. were religiously tolerant, that that was. I may have been leaving out a couple things. Yes, and there were people like I I filmed a series in Turkey, and there were like I had fans reaching out to me like, "Why are you giving that?" country press don't you know about the armenian genocide and like i i didn't know a lot about it but i think it was during world war one and they kind of like suspected the armenians of working against them uh in the war and so just like yeah started a mass extermination of them i uh i watched i was on netflix and uh there's this movie that I was I was scrolling through and I found this movie which apparently was Turkish propaganda, and I it was about uh, someone coming to help during World War One to be a nurse. I think it, it might be the Promise. Um, yeah. Or maybe it wasn't the Promise. It may have been the response to the Promise, uh, but basically it starts framing the Armenian genocide in this weird way about like the Armenians being like terrorists and war is war. And I start, I stopped it halfway through and I was like, wait, what the fuck? And I Googled the movie and it was, it was Turkish propaganda. <laughs> okay. And I was like, <laughs> cause halfway through they just started justifying like heavily why they were killing these Armenians, these Christians. And they just like, like there was out of context stuff. It was like that scene in transformers where they take like 15 minutes to describe Romeo and Juliet laws about why two actors were like so much different in age but in a relationship and i was like wait a second this is weird people will always find whatever justification they need to kill somebody that they don't like yeah should we yeah, talk it's the about promise the promise all right yeah. i'll have to look that up if you guys are looking for another movie no, oh, no wait, i'm lying it's the ottoman lieutenant was okay. the Turkish propaganda film. Okay. The Promise was the good movie. Well, the I, I don't. The Lieutenant was. The yeah, I don't response. think we should say like, "Hey, if you're looking for great Turkish propaganda, yeah. I highly recommend." <laughs> no, I'm just warning. If you come across the Ottoman Lieutenant on Netflix because it's on there, it's Turkish propaganda. This okay, is some Kyrie football stuff. <laughs> no, it's it is. Not. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. yeah. No, you're just you're simply passing along what you thought was a fascinating movie. Right, but like people, people might watch that conclusions. and have that. That might be their only like uh explanation of the events and it's very wrong yeah um i do i gotta get going because i've got this baseball thing that i have to do so i'm on my way right now to throw two innings against the university of illinois chicago oh wow and i have to get six outs against them so i might be there for i don't know seven eight hours holy shit we'll find out we've got um some of the boys from part of my take playing in the outfield i think the baseball team is actually playing the infield positions, but I'm pitching big cats, catching Jerry's umping. I think we got Jake in left field, Max in center, Hank in right. I think I'm not sure. We're going to find out. Um, but is I get going to be outside. I mean, it's going to be outside. It's like 30 degrees. Jesus. Yeah. It's going to be pretty chilly. Um, I got spider tack. So my grip strength is going to be good. I think six outs against a, a D one college baseball team. I don't know what division they are. I don't know how oh, that yeah. works in college, but against their good division baseball, one, they're player. usually pretty good. Good. Curtis okay. Anderson played there. That's going to be tough. Awesome. You're going to want to grease up Jerry. Just. Yeah, I always do. Um, I've got a, a nasty knuckle curve. So that's my, 
That's my out pitch. You got to have an out Your pitch, arm right? is going to be dead. In this yeah, cold, my, bro? My arm's probably already dead. You're going to so, you're going to have to get Tommy John surgery after today. I've I low key need Tommy John surgery, but Billy fixed it. Um, oh, okay. but my my labrum on my right shoulder has I've got a torn rotator cuff, like a 190 210 degree uh labrum tear. Uh and I've got so my my shoulder used to dislocate all the time when I played rugby. And then sometimes when that happens, when it pops back in, you get like small fractures oh, at the shit. top of your arm. So I've got those have probably all healed. But um, last time I got an MRI, it looked like a, a hand grenade went off in my shoulder. So hopefully I'll make it through today. Um, my my best hope, I think, is just serving meatballs and hope they pop out. Yes. Okay. Yep. So we'll, we'll see. But if you guys want to keep going, by all means, please do. Yeah, because uh, I'm sure there's more stuff we got to get into, maybe even a voicemail. Um, but the rest of the show is going to be brought to you by Sport Clips because your hair may grow fast, but after going to Sport Clips haircuts, you're going to wish that it grew even faster. And that's because Sport Clips has the best seats in hair. May or may not be because they happen to be right in front of TVs playing sports all day, every day. We know watching sports while getting a haircut sure beats watching your reflection get a haircut, which is why at Sport Clips, every day is clippers and curveballs, high tops, Hail Marys, and even waves and wickets. So at Sport Clips, you can check in with the pros in men's hair and totally check out. You get pure, uninterrupted relaxation. So come, watch an endless stream of sports on TV, get an awesome haircut. I love the MVP experience. You get the hot steam towel. You get the massaging shampoo. You really do feel like a king. You feel like a sultan in the Ottoman Empire when they give you that yeah. hot steam towel. And if you're ever worried about not needing haircuts in the future because you're going bald, mm -hmm. I'll bring you to Istanbul. It's the hair transplant capital of the world. There you go. Yeah. Sport clips. It's a game changer. Okay. PFT headed out. I hope it's really because he has to play baseball and not that Billy and I were boring him too much with <laughs> Ottoman history. Um, but we can move on from Ottoman history to Turkish history. Uh, I guess I'll do the solo because Billy's maybe taking a piss break. But um, yeah, so the Ottoman Empire lost World War I and afterwards, uh, the Allied forces were just going to kind of divide up Istanbul into an international settlement where there would be like a French zone, a British zone, a Russian zone. Um, and yeah, they were, I guess they were going to have control over like large parts of, um, of what is modern day Turkey. The rest of the Ottoman Empire just got partitioned up by the British and French. That's kind of how we got into this whole mess with the Middle East right now. Um, but then this guy, a general, uh, his last name was Ataturk. Um, and he, uh, so they, they were going to give a lot of what is Turkey now to the Greeks, but he fought a war. It was the Turkish Greek war and um, defeated the Greeks and got, all of them out of Anatolia. Um, and seeing that he won that war, he was able to found the modern country of Turkey. Ottoman, it was like the Ottoman Empire was so old that it was a very outdated empire. Um, and like people knew it was going to collapse at some time. So when he founded Turkey, he was like, I want to make a modern secular country. And he did a great job of it. Um, like even to this day, they're probably one of the most secular Muslim countries out. Um, he was very progressive. He uh, allowed women the right to vote. I'm pretty sure in Turkey, women had the right to vote before the U.S. Something like that. I don't know. I know that like females had a lot of rights in Turkey. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He drank a lot. But other than that, he actually seems like he was he was the man. Um when Turkey was founded, there was this big thing where every Greek person in Turkey was kind of um, forced to move to Greece and every Turkish person in Greece was forced to move to Turkey. And that is created like there's still horrible blood between Turkey and Greece. Like every Greek person I've met hates Turkish people and same with Turkish people towards the Greeks. Um, but yeah, he... Ataturk was a much better ruler than the, the current guy in Turkey. What's his name? Like Erdogan? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think he's kind of like, he has some fascist tendencies. Um, and he's also trying to like 
erase the legacy of Ataturk and just be like, no, I get all credit for like successes that Turkey have had. Kind of being um, the Stalin to Ataturk's Lenin. Yeah, you could say that. But Turkey is still very important to this day because it controls the Bosphorus Straits. And as we know, there's a war going on right now in the Black Sea between Ukraine and Russia, two countries that border the Black Sea. And um, part of the rule, when when Turkey was formed, they stayed neutral in World War II, and they were only allowed to stay neutral if they signed this agreement that's saying like no military ships can like pass through the strait if they're currently involved in a war. Um, and like only ships, like civilian ships can freely move back and forth, but uh, definitely no aircraft carriers, no submarines can pass through the straits. So right now, Russia can't like, they can't move a bunch of warships through the straits um, and uh, or they can't move aircraft carriers through the straits. The US can't move aircraft carriers through the straits to support Ukraine. Um, and that's why right now they want to build this huge canal that would pretty much turn Istanbul into an island because if that canal was formed, they wouldn't have to abide by all of those old agreements about like what ships can go through. Um, and so then the U S could have aircraft carriers in the black sea. Russia could have more aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean. Wait, and they could they also do that on tolls. the European side. The canal. Yeah. Uh, so they, they recently started construction. It's not going to be done for a while, but yeah, it's on the European side. You can look up a map of what. Oh yeah. I'm just looking at, wow. In Turkey, it would be in Turkey technically still. The canal? Yeah. Yeah. It would kind of be like on one side of Istanbul would be the Bosphorus Straits. And then on the other side of the city, there'd be this man-made canal that would kind of turn it into an island. So would that be through the European side of Turkey or would it be in like Greece? It would be through the European side of Turkey. Huh. That's crazy. So wait, does and it? It's like, yeah. Well, it's not built yet. Right, right. I'm looking at the plans for it. Yeah, I think okay, people- Okay, so yeah, into, yeah, huh. And do you know that like the Bosphorus Straits are so important because also once you get to the Black Sea, you can go up the Danube, Danube River, and that connects all the way to Rotterdam, Rotterdam, Amsterdam. So you can go oh like- Oh my God, yeah. If you're like a ship from Shanghai, you can go up this Suez Canal through the Bosphorus Straits, then down the Danube River into the uh, Atlantic Ocean and like just trade directly with Amsterdam or Rotterdam. Whoa. So, yeah, I didn't realize that until last night. Rotterdam. Wait a second. I'm I'm having a blank on Rotterdam's country. Oh, it's the Netherlands. Oh, it is the Netherlands? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh, my God. I never realized that. I never realized there was a river that went all the way from so Rotterdam. Wow. There's one river that goes like almost the whole way. And then I guess they built a canal that connects that river to another river that then connects to the... Atlantic Ocean. It's uh that is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. The uh Danube, I can't pronounce it. The Danube. Danube River. That used to be like the ancient borders of the Roman Empire. It was like the northern border just cuz it kind of cuts through Europe. Wow, um, that goes all the way to – so it ends, and I guess where the canal ends up is in Germany, which it can then – Regensburg. Regis? Yeah, Regensburg, which I think that is where there's a connection. Yeah, sounds right to me. Um, Are there some other points about Istanbul in general you want to – touch on before we wrap this up 
it was a very interesting as we talked about earlier it's the connection sort of of uh asia and europe and probably would you say it's the end of the uh, silk road uh yeah i think it was yep. yeah and, and one that's of the, what, yeah and that's why it has one of the oldest bazaars in the world the grand bazaar the grand the, bazaar of istanbul which if you've been it's so because all the wares from asia basically they travel on the silk road and they basically get to the grand bazaar of istanbul where they sell like the craziest spices from all over asia and uh you know it's a very cool place to visit and it's as mark twain explained it it was a bee bee's nest of stores so yeah. there's like these little caverns yeah it's uh, a wild place i mean it's so old i think they were even using it during the byzantine empire yeah i think it dates all the way back uh mark twain yeah he described the grand bazaar as a monstrous hive of little shops and the agia sophia is the rustiest old barn in heathendom <laughs> but heathendom is that what he yeah called, he called the muslim world yeah he called the muslim world <laughs> heathendom uh <laughs> But he was a big fan of the of the Byzantine Basilica. Where they found Medusa. Yeah. That's cool. Um, like they found the the resting place of Medusa. Yeah, so it was the end of the Silk Road, but a crazy fact is the Ottoman Empire is sort of the reason why Columbus set out to find the New World. Because they used to like Venice and all of those countries used to just travel to the Middle East, travel to Constantinople, and that's where they would get all of the goods that had come in from the Silk Road. But when the Ottoman Empire took over, they started like ban any Christian traders. So they, they no longer had access to the Silk Road that way. So then that's when Portugal started to try to sail around, around Africa to get to Asia and then Columbus was like, why go around Africa when you can just go west? Because like he he knew that the world was round. He just thought the world was a lot smaller than it actually was. So he was like, we're going to like sail for three weeks maybe, and then we'll reach China. Um, yeah, so that like there would have been really not as much motivation to do those crazy trips if they could still just travel to the Middle East and, and get all those goods. The Ottoman Empire always posed the greatest threat to Christendom, as they said. Yeah. I mean, it is it is wild. They, like, conquered almost half of Europe. And they, like, I guess they were um, brutal pirates, too. So then... Ottoman pirates in the Mediterranean would just raid the entire Mediterranean coast of Spain and Italy, uh, Croatia, and they would just like show up, kidnap everyone, burn everything to the point where during the time where they dominated the Mediterranean, people would just move two miles inland. Like no one wanted to live on the sea. Huh. Whoa. There, uh, here's a crazy stat. The uh, Sultan Suleiman, the one, first crown, was deliberately constructed to challenge the papal tiara. So he basically wanted to make his crown way bigger than the Pope's to sort of like flex on the Christians. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he definitely flexed. At, at one point, they even invaded Italy, but they. Yeah. They had to back out at some point. But, in 1462, um, before they sacked, uh, before they conquested Constantinople, Sultan Mehmed said that it was a direct revenge for the sack of Troy. So he was oh, he was really? an archaeophile. This was Sultan oh, Mehmed the second. Oh, so he he did claim Troy. Yeah, they did claim Troy a little bit. But that, but that's like crazy. Like this dude was like, he visited the ruins of Troy and was just like, yo, we're, we're getting back. We're getting yeah. him back for this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wild. I do recommend visiting Turkey, especially at least Istanbul. 
um, just because it's it's such a cool city. I mean, I felt safe when I was there. I know they've had some attacks in the past, but they the government there does try to crack down on terrorism. Um, They're I mean, definitely most, one of the most westernized countries of the. Would you say it's the Middle East? Um, yeah, it, it, it is, it is considered the Asian side is considered the Middle East. I think it's one of the few countries in the Middle East where drinking alcohol is just fully, fully accepted. Um, they drink, what's it called again? Um, they all drink the same type of liquor, uh, Rocky tastes good. It kind of tastes like, um, licorice or what's that licorice vodka? That, uh Jägermeister? No, licorice vodka. Uh and they usually mix it with water. You serve it and once you pour in some uh water, it turns this milky color. I drank a lot of that um when I was there. And it goes down easy, but uh I was had a camel fight cuz I guess they still do uh, camel wrestling in parts of, of Turkey. And this guy, like they saw that I was the only white guy there. So they were just making me chug it. And, um, I felt great for a while. And then I was like, Jesus, I am blackout drunk. Oh, it tastes like Sambuca. If you've ever had uh, Sambuca, it almost tastes exactly like that. They're technically in NATO. Yeah, they are. And the reason they joined NATO is because, the USSR was trying to force them. They're like, like you can't stop us from uh, putting whatever ships we want through the strait. And then they're like, well, we can stop you if we join NATO. Because now if you fuck with us, you fuck with all of NATO. Huh. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah. What, this was a fun talk. Yeah, dude. I Turkey and Istanbul is like one of the most interesting cities in the world. It's one of those ones that like just has so much history, Ottomans, Byzantines, multiple empires. Alexander the Great got there. Yeah. And it, yeah, mean, it was just, it's crazy how before planes and stuff like that, if you ever had to bring an army from Europe to Asia, you would, you would always cross at that point. Cause that's where, that's where it, it's the shortest. Yeah, like because of the Ural Mountains? Uh, yeah, you have the Ural Mountains up there. And so, yeah, you just have to... I think actually when, when Alexander the Great invaded invaded Asia, he made a giant bridge across it, like using these floating rafts. And it was a large enough bridge that he transported the entire Greek army across it. Yeah, wow. Um. It is cool. Now, if you're there, they have like three bridges that go across it. Uh, you can take a ferry. They have a tunnel. Uh, it's like it's like an underwater tunnel. So, yeah, now it's very easy to get back and forth from Europe to Asia. Also, tons of stray cats. And dogs. Yeah. Ton- I we- think I saw more dogs than cats there. But no, you're right. They have... Stray dogs and stray cats, because in Turkish culture, you're supposed to feed all stray dogs and cats you see. So they're not super like like mangy looking dogs and cats. They look like they're really well taken care of. Yeah. Uh, and they also vaccinate them for rabies, which is good. Yeah. Because stray animals carry a lot of rabies turns out in saliva too so if like a dog licks you with rabies or a cat yeah. licks its paws and touches you but they do a good job of making sure that there's no rabies rabies is terrifying yeah i i came across some packs of wild dogs there but they were very friendly like at one point they were all charging it looked like they were all charging at me and i was like i'm so fucked but then they just ran right past me and they weren't they were just going for a jog around the city it turns out they take like the public transport there and know how to use it. That is insane. Yeah. There's that a pretty good movie of, yeah. uh, called Stray. It's like a documentary called Stray. 
and it's about all the stray dogs and cats in Istanbul. Is it is it like an animated movie? No, no, it's a documentary. Okay. They just follow oh. a stray dog around. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That I mean, if they know how to use the subway, that reminds me in Japan, they have like a reality TV show where these three-year-old kids, they like, parents will send out the three-year-old and be like, hop on the subway, go to this store, grab me like these ingredients from the store and come back. And the, like the three-year-old does it no problem. Huh. I guess a, a really smart dog might be similar to a, a three-year-old yeah. kid, you think? So it turns out uh, the historical sources from the Ottoman era show that dogs served as guards for neighborhoods, ate the garbage since there was no municipal sanitation services and would bark to alert people when there was fires, which used to happen a lot. So in the dogs predated the Ottomans there. Oh my God. Yeah, so that those are Byzantine dogs, I guess. Yeah, so when Solomon first entered the city, they didn't kill all the dogs because apparently uh, under Muslim doctrine, dogs aren't seen that favorably because the uncle of Muhammad was bitten by a dog. But the Byzant they saw that the Byzantine dogs were were very useful to ensuring the city didn't burn. Back during – this is the last fact, and then I, I have to head out. But back during the Byzantine era, you know how I said uh, chariot races were really popular? Uh-huh. So, like, everyone everyone in the city had to pick a team. You were either, like, the reds, the blues, the yellows, or the greens. Um, and then after one match, there was, like – I don't know. I think the outcome was heavily disputed. It turned into a huge fight between the – blues and the reds or something and then that expanded into just citywide riots where like 30,000 people were killed or something it was probably the worst sport riot of all time jeez well i guess that wraps it up why don't we yeah. uh, head in some voicemails and go this is cam from massachusetts hypothetical that's not really a hypothetical um when i was 19 i went to a bar and I met a woman who was older, much older. She was like 57. Um, hung out with her at the bar, took a liking to her, went back to her place. Now, the question is, the next morning, she offered for me to use her car and drive around and go hang out with my friends or whatever. And then we could come back and pick her up and then go to the beach and essentially she just wanted to join in um on the boys weekend with everybody now the question is is should i have allowed that to happen billy or should i have cut ties and went back home thanks guys love the show stay handsome stay beautiful no that's crazy did he I say did. what he was doing did he say what happened like I'm assuming that maybe he cut ties of her, but he's kind of thinking maybe I should have hung out with her. Yeah. So uh, I feel like it's a 57 year old who's trying to feel young again. And you know, if you want to make a 57 year old feel young for just one day, I don't see any harm. I, I do think it's weird that the 57 year old would want to just hang out with a bunch of 19 year old boys for the day, but maybe it's her last hurrah. Your other 19-year-old friends do not want to hang out with a 57-year-old woman. If it comes well, with she a free actually, car? No, dude, you're 19. This is No, this is perfect, bro. This woman gets your age. No, they might think they're your mom, but she could buy booze for the 19-year-olds. So Ooh. that's the big – like we forgot. These guys are 19. They can't buy alcohol. This woman can buy alcohol for you and hypothetically – talk bartenders into serving you drinks by being like these are my sons they're 21 i swear or something like that or like to bouncers and help you get into places this is actually a much bigger asset as a 19 year old definitely than than you know if you were 21 i'd be like okay like she doesn't really add much but you have a huge hurdle that can only be solved with fake ids and older women so that's a number one reason why you should be bringing her around yeah. Plus, she could DD. 
Yes, I, I actually, Billy's making some great points. And also there's no risk of you guys being kidnapped or anything. It's like you and your boys and one 57 year old woman. Like if she tries anything crazy or gets too weird, you guys can easily be like, all right, please back the fuck up. We're going to get out of the car. Like there's no risk of something going, even if, if she turns out to be like a creep or a psychopath, I think you guys could easily get out of the situation. Yeah, dude, go on a joy ride with the 57 year old. Yeah. Now I will say it'd be, it would make a huge difference. Like it'd be a lot more normal if she was even 47, 57 is up there. That's old. That's yeah. That's very old, but I don't know. Isn't like she, she's still technically according to this guy, you know, serviceable. 37's yeah. cool. 47's borderline. 57 is really old. I agree with that. But yeah, I mean, it's also like if he was willing to go home with her. Yeah, she, she, she must, can't be that bad. She must at least come off as 47. She might Could be, be. A 57 year old who looks like a 47 year old, but what you really want is a 47 year old who looks like a 38 year old. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 worth it for the story. It's such a hilarious story. I don't see how we could go like way south unless she's like a criminal on the run, and then you guys somehow get like wrapped up in her crime. Even better, like you have plausible deniability. Like, hey, I just slept with this woman. She said we could use her car. And yeah, that'd be funny. Yeah, it'd be funny if she was like, "Yeah, you, you can use my car," and then she like goes and do a, a bank and robs it and gets <laughs> in the car and is like, "Drive." I th I do think that fifty seven like if these kids are were I think he's a nineteen a nineteen year old's mom isn't even fifty seven most of the time like she's older than most of your moms. So I feel like 57 is, if she is older than the majority of your friend's moms, I feel like maybe it's not worth it. Arian would probably have a different answer to that question, but I, I've, at a certain point, that's predatory. And you don't need to invite her on the boys' trip, even if it includes a car and alcohol. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if the genders were reversed Ex there. Exactly. <laughs> it, would be a, yeah. it would be a huge no. Exactly. Uh, Actually, yes. no, I mean, 19, you know how many, it would be a huge no. Yeah, 19, okay. A 19 it would be different girl? if it wasn't a car and it was a yacht. If they're like, do you want to come ride around mm. in my yacht? But then you're, you're sort of trapped on a yacht. That's even scarier. Yeah. yeah. Dude, that happens yeah. so much. Girls going on boat, old dudes boats. It does. And sometimes the old man just wants to look cool with the girls. He's not going to like try anything creepy with them, but you run the risk. If he gets super creepy, there's really no way to get off a yacht. Right. You got to like jump ship. Yeah. Like if you, if you're like, put it in perspective, like your 19 year old sister was banging a 57 year old, like oil tycoon or something. That's yeah. yeah no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I won't be on next week. Maybe I'll contact from Uganda. Uh, I'm traveling halfway across the world. Maybe I never come back. Uh, but Donnie and I will probably make it smoothly. Thank you guys. And uh, PFT and Arian and Big T will hopefully be with you next week. Love you guys. I'll get you back in one piece. Um.